Let's talk about your technology. What are you using and why did you choose to use this technology? What's in my camera bag here? The, yeah. the <laughs> Brendan edition. Yeah, there we go. That's in my, that's in my camera bag right what? here. So I have a state of the art <laughs> two camera system. I don't even have the third camera on here. And, but, but, oh yeah, sound, sound, so, sounds, 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 everything. What's in, oh, there it is. The best microphone that I could come up with right here. <laughs> Welcome to the Fruiting Body Podcast with your host, Brendan O'Neill. We are here in Phuket, Thailand, and today we have an amazing guest. He is probably one of the most famous YouTubers for lifestyle in, let's say, the world. I don't know, at least in Thailand. Um, so today we are welcomed by Chris Parker from Retired Working For You. Now, this is special to me as well because I usually watch his uh, vlogs during lunch. So it's, uh, I know they say don't meet your heroes, but let's see how this goes. <laughs> <laughs> okay, uh, Chris, thanks, thanks a lot for joining us today. It's much appreciated. I know your time is tight. Um, so now you're in Phuket. And as we explained a little bit before we're jumping into the podcast, we want to build your journey to share with your viewers uh, about who truly Chris is, let's say, behind the camera. So let's start off as a young Chris back in Peterborough. Oh, you know your stuff. You got a crack research team here. <laughs> um, well, I watched, so I, I understand. Peterborough. Yeah. Wow, that's and going Bob, back. And Bob Cajun. So we got, I know you're a hip fan, so we'll <laughs> talk a bit about that and Sure. Yeah, so you grew, you grew up in Peterborough, and was this just a typical uh, 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 childhood? Uh, oh, yeah, it's completely typical Peterborough childhood, man. So, so elementary school, you know, after school, jumping on a bike with a bunch of your buddies, ripping around the back parks and stuff, getting into some trouble, and uh, home by dark. Uh, you know, and back at it again, but I did move out of Peterborough halfway through, uh, seventh grade, grade yeah. seven, we moved up uh, to the outskirts of Toronto, a suburb called Markham, which you yes. know. Yes. I know Markham. Yeah. So yeah. it was kind of the, the childhood, the pure childhood was Peterborough and it was an awesome place for it. Yeah. Similar to me. I grew up in a place outside of Hamilton called Waterdown which is outside of Burlington. So similar, it's a town of 30,000. So, you know, uh, but these towns, they, they developed like, so I'm, I'm born 1985, but when I first sure, lived, rub it in. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> when I first lived there, it was like just pure development and, and, you know, different construction sites going up. But as a kid, you're, you're mucking around in these, these developments and kind of, you know, riding your mountain bikes and, you know, a oh, yeah. typical, not like today where I think everything's kind of going social and digital and uh, it's completely different. Oh yeah. Yeah. It's, it's different for kids growing up today. Even our daughter, man, she's 18 now. And sometimes she even fondly wishes that she grew up in our era, even though she loves, they all love their technology. But I think there's a bit of a, a bit of a, a realization that, life without it as a kid could have been pretty sweet too. Yeah, they're missing out maybe on that side of connecting to nature and like actually connecting with your friends as well, right? Yeah. And do, uh, you recently went back and I saw there was a, a pretty cool vlog you did with your parents when you went from the, the oh, past yeah, to the they, future. I thought that was pretty cool how you did that. It was very creative. Um, how was your time in Canada? It was awesome, man. It was great. Went back um, right at the end of July and uh, we, the reason we went back was because our daughter was starting up university. So it was a big, big uh, ch moment in our lives, a milestone moment. We only have one daughter and she's moving out for the first time ever. My wife Haley and I are going to be on our own. Empty nesters, I guess we are now. And uh, and yeah, so it was that part of it was was really interesting and uh really the definition of bittersweet man like i couldn't think of something that defines that word any better than than letting your only kid go off to university but she's doing great it was great to see the the parent my parents back in peterborough they live there yep. still um kind of trip down memory lane around some of those old parks we used to rip our dirt bikes around and then uh, saw all my old buddies you know which mm. is always a treat it had been two years 
since I'd been back. So it was an absolute treat. And then uh, after, you know, you make the rounds once. When you visit home, it's kind of weird. Because yeah, everything changes. Yeah, well, like, everything changes, but you're also making the rounds, right? Yeah. So you're seeing everyone for the first time in a while, which is awesome. But then at the same time, it's like you're rehashing the same kind of stories, the catching up stories, how's things, mm -hmm. what have you been up to? And it's like, and so that part of it is good, but a little bit tiring. Yeah. And then got to spend some really good time with, with some family and, and close friends on top of that, which was awesome. And then Thailand started calling me again, yeah, it's, man. It's, it started calling after about a me. month. You know, when you get back home, I find uh, you. I get about a month in, and then you get the itch. Yeah, I, I don't know. For me personally, I've been in Southeast Asia for about almost at least eleven years. I used I've, I lived in China for five, Taiwan for one, and now here almost six. Oh, wow. And when you go back home, you 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 start to realize how much more I find personally. There's more freedom here. Now, I, I don't know what, I don't mean like freedom in terms of like the political side, just in terms of you can oh, do I know what, what you mean. Yeah, man. you can I have know. a beer on the beach and sure. like you don't have to worry about looking over your shoulder. You can have a couple beers and maybe whatever. You can drive a motorbike or go home. Yeah. I'm not saying you got to drink 12, but let's talk about in Canada. It's like, okay, I've had one. I've, and it starts to, there's a lot of pressure on you. When, oh, when yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah, it's my favorite thing about uh, Thailand and Southeast Asia in particular, man. It's got a bit of that Wild West uh, spirit where, uh, where yeah, it, and it attracts people that are attracted to that, mm -hmm. which which makes it for an interesting cast of characters over here. And, uh, yeah, it's, it's just it, things are changing. Things seem a lot more vibrant back there. One of my friends told a good story. He was back home uh, recently as well, and he said, you know, Got together with all my old high school friends. And it was kind of weird because everyone got together. It was, uh, you know, Sunday afternoon. And, and everyone had their two drinks. Talking. And then about two hours in, everyone kind of picked up and said, oh, I guess we're going home now. And everyone kind of left. And he was like, I said to my buddy, I'm not going anywhere, man. We're just you getting know? started. <laughs> we, he lives on Samui for 15 years. He's like... The, I, like the sun could come up just as easy as we all go home in two hours. And that part of it is a lot different. The unpredictability of, of life over yeah, here. Yeah, same going back home and you're seeing friends with the family and the kids and and uh, the dynamic has changed. And it's, you know, it's that feeling, that nostalgic feeling is gone where, you know, you could go out and um, as, especially as a kid and kind of go home anytime you want. But now when you go to like dinner parties and stuff, it's, it feels like it's there is that lockdown. It's like okay, nine o'clock, everyone's got to go home, and if you're the guy staying there after nine, people are kind of giving you that that look like party's yeah. done. Yeah, yeah, exactly. What what's going on? <laughs> then he wouldn't leave, man. The guy <laughs> just hung around. Yeah, it's it's uh it's it's different. And do you find when you go back home, like not just your friends, but the country itself is changing? Yeah, in ways. But uh, you know, living in Asia, I think that's it. it, it it's almost, it, it moves in slow motion back there, the change, I find. I, that's one of the things I've always loved about Asia. And I've noticed it ever since my time back living in Korea. It almost feels like the ground's moving under your feet over here, how fast they get things done. You know, an example is Bangkok. Since I've been living, I lived there for the past two years, I can't even count the number of new BTS SkyTrain stations they've opened, full new lines, yeah. let alone stations. Go back to uh, go back to Toronto, and it's like, man, ten years to get five stations opened, you know. And and there's not as much red tape, right? They yeah. kind of they push things ahead, and they just get it done. Like even let's say the back roads here of Bangtao, like. They'll do the entire, they did all the roads back here. It was a mess about a year ago, but obviously during the current situation, there's not as much traffic, so they could do it. But they'll do it in two days. Yeah. You try that back home, it'll take them six months. Oh, yeah. One, one of the busiest streets in Toronto, Queen Street, which you would know, yeah. closed right in the heart of downtown. And, and I was watching the news. It's going to be five years closed. I'm like five years? Like what do you, five year construction yeah, project on a street? Well, they drag it out, right? Oh, well, winter. Well, winter's about 
13 months. So <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, so maybe they, they, and also, so the more they can drag it out, the more those construction companies can make and who knows what's going on. There. Yeah. Yeah. So it's, yeah, it is, it is different back there. I do notice things change, but at the same time, like uh, I, I, one of the things that draws me back to Asia is, mm. is, is the pace over here seem just seems a lot faster. Mm. So what originally brought you to Asian, maybe a two part question, like your, your show is retired working for you. Well, how did you get retired? What were you doing in Canada and what led you to come here? Yeah. I mean, well, it is a two part question because my first, my first foray into Asia was a different life. It was, it was, you know, 1994 when I was 22 years old, I moved to, to Korea at okay. the time so that was previous to to the career mm -hmm. uh lived there for a while that's where i fell in love with asia and um you know part of that i, I had been in seoul for two months 22 years old this was 94 too. things were a little different there was no internet really were you traveling were you no i went or? i got i i had finished university and you know came to the realization i took my final trip uh, in the the last reading week of my last year university, we went down to Cuba, me and a bunch of buddies. Yep. Had a great time, but also met some Cuban people and saw like a bit of, got, got outside of the resort town we were in and dug a little deeper. And it, and it changed me a little bit. And so got back to university, strolling across the university parking lot with my buddy. And we're like, man, we're going to be graduating in two months have you been over to the recruitment office? Bunch of insurance sales jobs and stuff. Like, do you want to jump right into that and start to climb the corporate ladder? And we're like, hell no, we don't want to do that. And so uh, we ended up moving to Korea, one-way tickets. It was going to be Korea, Japan, or Australia. Mm -hmm. And at the time, Korea was famous for how much you could save teaching English. Yeah. And you could just show up on a Thursday. You've got a full-time job by the next Monday. And so we just got one-way tickets on that wing and a prayer. With and no jobs lined up, you'll figure it out when you get there. Yeah, yeah. Yes. And, it, and it worked out awesome. It was yeah. great. Fell in love with Asia. And about two months into that trip, we were drinking at a bar. Some guy starts telling stories about this place called Koh Samui. Mm. And so this is 94, right? Like, you know, just finished watching Pulp Fiction cut to crap in a Korean movie theater. It was like half of a movie, basically, because they weren't allowed to They're show... They're censoring everything. They censored yeah. everything back then. Yeah. And so we were feeling adventurous and, and just came down to check Samui out. That was the love of Thailand. Then fast forward, did have a 20-year a, a career. Mm -hmm. And then it, it was always in the back of my head, wanted to kind of retire in Thailand, move to Thailand, and, you know... It just, the, the, the career was fun. We were doing some cool stuff for a while and then it turned to be into it what wasn't fun or enjoyable. So you're doing, what, what were you doing in Canada? Yeah, in uh, Canada for half of it and then LA for half of it. And are, are you allowed to discuss what you're yeah, doing? Yeah, or? yeah, yeah, what, yeah. It was because I think, I don't think you mentioned, uh, from what I've seen, I don't think you've mentioned it much on your. Not vlog, too much, a couple of times, but yeah. not but not too much. Yeah, it worked, had a 20 year career in the film business. Oh, okay. Yeah, and so uh, the, the non glamorous side of the film business, uh -huh. I will point out, the non creative side too. Okay. So started out on set um, as a PA. I was, you know, getting people lattes and, and an old one too, because I'd spent four years in Korea. So I was the oldest PA on set and, uh, and, uh, you know, I didn't know what was going on, but I thought I'll try the film business. It sounds, it sounds cool. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and I worked my way up, uh, to what they call a video assist guy. And then when there was a moment in time that I was really, they say right place, right time. And it, and I was lucky enough that that happened to me. And, and it was when 35 millimeter film changed to digital. Uh, there was a camera that came out called the red camera and, uh, and no one, all these legacy companies were afraid of it because they had so much invested in, the in style in, of 35 in 35, not even the style, just the, the money. Mm -hmm. of of the the equipment the machinery the process i'm talking about technicolor yeah deluxe the only two companies that process film really and so suddenly people are pulling chips off the back of cameras instead of mags of 35 mil film and nobody 
would know what to do with the chip. And I was, I was, I had, I was geeking out about it for like a year straight. And I was, I said, give that chip to me. I know what to do with it. And so I did that and we grew from five people to 550 staff and opened up Atlanta, New York, LA, Vancouver, Toronto. Was this your company you started up? Yeah. And, and it was more in the, the video editing side. No, no, it was workflow. Workflow. We were workflow and then we merged and, be, and then, and then, it all happened so fast. Like this shift was this this paradigm shift overnight. Everyone suddenly wanted to shoot uh, these digital cameras and and get away from the film. And so the studios said, like we love, like we got a job with Universal. Technicolor had a job with their first two digital films or um, mm-hmm. TV series ever. After it all unfolded, they said we want to give you all of our shows like well it's just me and a laptop man and he's like that's a problem technicolor can do that and you got to learn how to say yes to all my shine we shoot all over and so i we couldn't grow the quick enough so we merged and acquired and it got and just grew as quick as we can by kind of rolling together a few companies in different cities just partnering with the right people and yeah, yeah, it was a bit of a roll up yeah. where where we were we we got some capital behind us and started buying companies to uh, allow us to expand as quick as we needed to, which was fun. That was fun while it lasted, and then we got into so we had camera rentals, lighting rentals, post production. Like we did all the final color on yeah. Game of Thrones. We'd supply cameras on Stranger Things, mm-hmm. you know, lighting on Deadpool. But th- this is this is your your company. You're running it with some business partners. At this yeah, point? Th- this is my company. Then we've merged with another company called Sim, and then we brought in some uh, capital partners by the name of Granite. Through that, yeah. we had a fund to go and acquire several other companies, which allowed us to get into L.A., New York. And then, yeah, so then we just built that ever-evolving structure of the organization to be able to to manage it the best we could. And so I had many hats. I was the the founder of my own initial company. Then I was the CTO of the um, amalgamated company. Yep. Then I was president of post-production for the amalgamated company. And then um, I ended off as chief business development officer as part of the team of five that just kind of... Uh, charted the course for that. And that's when I started hating it. Yeah. I mean, at that, even for my, myself, well, I, I wear many hats. I mean, I have this business. I have an, I do actually electronics manufacturing in China. Oh. So this is, um, I don't want to call it a hobby. It will, it is becoming a business because of the medicinal mushroom stuff, but what pays the bills and pays for this is electronics manufacturing. I do a custom led display. Oh, really? So when you go to like uh, airports and casinos oh, and yeah. you see custom spheres, I yeah, make cool. this in China. Oh, nice. Uh, yeah. The Netflix lobby in LA, when that launched, like that, the, that, I, that blew people's minds, that LED display. This is kind of, so I do all of uh, Google's headquarters, uh, Facebook oh. headquarters, uh, Hong Kong airport, uh, Lisboa casinos in Macau. Wow. I just did the new resort That's world, cool. the new resort world casino in Vegas. Yeah. So if you're ever there, when you walk in the lobby, there's a massive 50 foot LED display sphere. Yeah, I made that. Oh wow! Anyway, that's so, wild. But now we're sitting in a room. I see a whiteboard and yeah. it says uh, mushrooms up there. I like yeah, that. Yeah, that's yeah. funny. <laughs> this was um, <laughs> these were notes. I had a integrative oncologist on two weeks ago. Name's Dr. Thomas Lodi. He's, he's famous in Phuket. He's an American physician. Um, so I needed to take notes. I put about eight hours of research to be able to have a conversation with this guy because oh really? It got quite technical. Well, so I had good, to carry myself. Good thing I'm here because you just needed a couple of ice cold Leos. <laughs> That's what to, I thought. To, I'm like, you know what? For this one, I, I don't. I don't need to do too much research. <laughs> if I give him a couple beers, I think we'll be all right. <laughs> yeah, yeah, perfect. Now the only problem is hopefully like. The more we drink, probably later in the podcast, they might need subtitles if this Canadian accent comes out too. Well, strong. I don't know what you're <laughs> talking about, eh? Good grace, uh, if, if I can understand, it's fine, guys. <laughs> <laughs> it's still good. Still good. <laughs> yeah. So, long story short, yeah. when it got to the point where it was so big, it was fun building it. It was cool, but then it was less about the shows, more about the money. It all became about spreadsheets and dollars and this, and then it started really being terrible. And I wanted out. And, and bless my wife, man, like m- most people I think would be involved in the opposite situation where I'd be, you know, clamoring to get out. And my wife's saying, what the hell, you're giving up this crazy gig here in L.A., life couldn't be better. 
you know, everything's great. What, what are you talking? But she was the opposite. She said, then, then don't wait. Like, let's do it. Our daughter had two years of high school left. So I, a lot of people out there that might be considering this with kids would probably be thinking to themselves what we were, ah, just when school's done. We'll think about it when school's done. We'll stay put till school. But we did it with two years of high school left. She hated us when we gave her the news. 16-year-old girl in Culver City. Yeah. Life's pretty great, man. And so it was about three months that she hated us. And we thought to ourselves, this will be good for her. And my wife was the strong one. I was ready to cave, man. Oh, no, it's okay. I don't want we're, yeah. we're We're ruining her life. And she's like, no. She said, burn the boats, man. Let's go. And we did. And our daughter now will, will firmly admit and say that it was an amazing, like she had a great time at high, to finishing off high school in, and, ba in Bangkok. And ba so that was the move to come to Bangkok. Now, your, your, yeah. your, your wife, Haley, yeah. Yeah. She's, uh, is she Thai? So he did do some research. I, I like that. That's good. Yeah. Uh, no, she's Korean. Korean. See that part? Yeah, I wasn't sure about that. Because she, she, I see her on camera sometime, but not much. Yeah, she doesn't like to be yeah. on camera. She's not yeah. a fan of it. Yeah. So I, I twist her arm and get her on as much as yeah. I can because I know everyone else likes likes it when she's on. Uh, and, yeah. and I, yeah, I met her when I was living in Korea in the 90s. So we've been married 21 years. Mm -hmm. You know, had our honeymoon 21 years ago, not far from here over in uh, uh, Raleigh Beach and, and Co. Yeah. PP in 2000. So, yeah. Mm. So the, your, now your transition... Why did you decide Bangkok and, and putting her in, I'm assuming international school in Bangkok. Yeah. Um, why Bangkok? Was that to go back to that itch in the back of your mind of Koh Samui and kind of getting into Thailand as a stepping stone? Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it was probably would have been Samui um, if the international school there was up to par with what we wanted for her, for her final two years of high school. They got a great international school. Yeah. There's the, one of the number ones in all of Asia, I believe. I, my, I actually have a friend that's a teacher, a uh, teacher there. It's, I forget the name of I it. I think ISS. Something like this. Yeah. yeah. It's like even, uh, you'll get kids coming from Hong Kong and Singapore to go to this school. Oh, really? Yeah. It's a great school, but it kind of starts to fall apart. They're just still building out the high school end of it. Okay. So in a few years, it might be uh, also great for the, for those age groups. But we have friends on Samui that have a girl our daughter's age, and when, they, when she hit her second last year of high school, she also moved up to Bangkok mm -hmm. because they wanted something a little more. So that was the reason for Bangkok. And how was the transition for the family when you're first landing in Bangkok? Because again, um, I'm assuming your your tie is limited, probably if anything zero at this point. Yeah. Um, which is fine because in Thailand you don't really need it. Um, you land in Bangkok. You're setting up in school. You, I'm, I'm assuming you're getting your, your your condo all set up. How did you transition into that? Was it quickly? Was it slow? Were there any issues? It had to be quick because we came over in the first week of August. 2019 and then um here, i'll put this over there for you oh there you go <laughs> he takes care of his guests here oh we got some more downstairs Our high budget program <laughs> uh, we're, we're on here yeah, yeah. no labat blues though yes. sorry no no, no <laughs> oh, that's import. okay I, this is all right with me so it had to be quick I yeah. mean, we, we showed up, we moved in August, first week of August. I think it was an August 3rd, 2019 into our condo and her high school was starting the next week her, So, because they started early here. So it was just hit the ground running. There was no time to settle in and, and it was all right. We've been coming to Thailand pretty much every year. Our daughter came since she was two years old. Thailand was nothing new to us. Living in Bangkok was mm -hmm. for sure. But uh, it was all about sc the schooling at first, and it was that was easy enough. That like schools, she, she goes home, goes to school, and then just that was the first phase of integrating in. But what was your plan? I mean, you, you're at this point you're retired officially, yeah, and you're coming into Bangkok, but you probably need something to keep you busy. I mean, what was yeah. your plan for for you and your wife? We're just gonna travel. Just to travel. Yeah, yeah, just, well, just to, to, first of all, take a breath. It was an intense 20 years run in that film gig. So first of all, it was going to be take a breath, do some traveling. Bangkok's an awesome hub to be based out of for that, you know. Yeah, because you can fly anywhere. Anywhere for yeah. cheap and short. Yeah. And so 
couple months in, daughter's settling in, made some friends, school's looking good, great. I went, I zip over to Nepal, three and a half hour flight, yep. climb a mountain, spend a week, you know, uh, scratching that itch. And it was great. A couple months later, we all go to Korea. Christmas, New Year's in Seoul, visit the old friends and family there. Awesome. What's next? Well, we all know what happened next. Current situation, yeah. And so yeah. that got taken away from us. Uh, the, 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 and, and that directly led to this. It's the only reason I started the YouTube channel. Yeah, I initially, now obviously I, I'm not going to say I'm your first subscriber, but I, I went back and looked at some of your old videos. So you just started off doing a push-up challenge for yeah. the deaths in Canada of the current situation. Yeah. Um, I'm not going to go into strategy and YouTube process or anything like that, but I was interested in the transition from it being a challenge and turning into retired working for you. Uh -huh. I saw... I wasn't be I wasn't able to pinpoint that that time, but I did. I was trying to figure that out on the back end. Yeah. I saw a couple of videos where you, then you started to say it, but I never saw when was that video where yeah. it changed. It was on the ferry ride back after that first uh, stint in Samui when when Bangkok was closed up. We decided to to, to spend that first stint in Samui, and then okay, it was time to go back to Bangkok. School was going to go back from being online to in person. And so, and it felt like, okay, this situation was going to last a lot longer yeah. than we bargained for. So it's like, well, I love making these videos. I had started kind of doing more than just live streaming uh, some push ups from my living room, started kind of going around the island, and, yeah. and that was getting fun. And I thought, you know what? I, I love doing this. I'm just going to try and go full full out, make a YouTube channel. But you channel. had no intention at the beginning of, was it more just, you were kind of bored and let's have some fun on the camera, let's do something? Oh, that was it. It was, it was let's connect with some people back in Canada, friends okay. and family. Yep. Let's, and that's who it was. They were doing push-ups with me. It was like every yep. day, let's do push-ups. And it was old friends that, I'd, that I hadn't seen, couldn't see. Travel was no longer allowed. Everyone was feeling a little isolated. So I'm like, well, I'm just going to broadcast push-ups based on the number of uh, the number of fatalities from the previous yeah, day. It. And who wants to join me back home? And there's like 30 or 40 old friends and family. That's what it was. Well, I saw the first one. I, I watched it today at lunch, and I'm like, so I just watched your, your oldest one, the first one. It's You did 35, and I'm like, gee, what happened at episode 40? Is he yeah, doing yeah. like 10,000? <laughs> no, no, there was only 100. It only yeah, maxed so, out at 180, I think, okay. which was which was enough. And, and so then, yeah, on the ferry ride on the way back, I made two videos that day. One was the push-up challenge, and one was the first video for Retired Working For You, the trip from Samui to Bangkok. Mm-hmm by ferry and cheap flight. Where did this brand name come from or did it just kind of sporadically you just you said this on camera? No, no, I thought about it. I thought, okay, now I'm going to you know, I'm uh, I want to have a channel. If I if I have something I want it to just uh, mean something and you know, so that was it. I just thought that was it. Yeah. That's what I'm doing. I'm retired first of all. But I, working was a reminder for me that if I'm going to go at this, it, it, I was, you know, uh, believe hard work gets you a lot of places. Mm -hmm. And you had a double meaning, the viewers, you, everyone out there around the world and YouTube. So I thought uh, that's it. I'll just say that. And yeah, and <laughs> it's easy to connect to your, your, I'm assuming your demographic is more North American, maybe, maybe Australia, UK a bit. And, I'm, and you're, you're providing content for people that, could essentially be in your shoes and preparing them for that, that transition. Is that the intention? Yeah, there was like the intention wasn't clear until I, until last month when I was in Toronto and I had my first ever subscriber meetup and the intention has all crystallized based on the heels of that event. And the, and so early on the intention, I didn't know it was, it was to just, make videos yeah yep. it, 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 fun and informative that was it that was all i had that was my north star mm -hmm. i wanted to make videos that were fun and informative about thailand and what it is now is so clear to me and i love it it's it's like i want to be like the worldwide ringleader 
for Thailand lovers mm -hmm. because people who love this country, man, like it's a pretty passionate subject. So I had the meetup in Toronto last month and I didn't think anyone would show up. We're in Toronto. Well, I mean, suddenly the, 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 the room we had gotten at this awesome Thai restaurant uh, called Pie suddenly fills up and the owner tugs on my arm. He said, we have a problem. Go outside. People all lined up down the street. I, like, it was nuts, man. I couldn't believe it. A couple hundred? Are you talking thousands? There, no, 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 no. God, no. Like, let's not get carried <laughs> okay. away here. But, easy, yeah, easy. but there was like, there was, I don't know, there was maybe a hundred uh, that couldn't get in. And so, and, and I talked to everyone and talked to everyone that was there that night. And what it turned into was just a group of people who wanted to get in a room with a bunch of people and swap stories about Thailand and th and how much they love it and when the, when are they going back and when they last went and so that's that's kind so of so it the didn't mission. it didn't become so much about you anymore at this point it you're bringing people together that yeah. can share their stories and 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 and. and maybe create a friendship if they're going to thailand hey i'll be there at this time maybe we meet up something like this yeah exactly yeah yeah, yeah. just to just a, a community of of thailand and i love i've always loved thailand people in the film industry man they got sick of hearing me tell stories about thailand I'm supposed to be at a business meeting here with a netflix executive telling them about how great our company is and all i'm doing is telling them stories about Thai. you should see what goes on in Samoa man holy crap you got to get over there and then you'd meet the odd one oh the other then there's that mark the netflix exec he'd be like oh yeah i love it too let's talk because <laughs> there's a there's probably a lot of things you can't talk on camera but thailand is is very special why, why is it special to you what is it about thailand if you're to explain it in just a couple sentences um it's uh, overall man it's 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 definitely relates to the people the vibe i i i th i noticed it when we came back here my wife and i as soon as we got off the plane here in phuket immediately want it just it it makes me a friendlier person it makes me like i wanted to suddenly converse with the strangers mm -hmm. and they have smiles that you can even see when they have masks on man you can tell their eyes are smiling they're so inviting and warm and then there's the the we talked about the wild west aspect there's no winter yeah um, that's the number one right like the food's awesome it's pretty cheap compared to a lot of places or it certainly can be um you put it all together man for me it's by bar none the greatest country uh on earth for me yeah and especially for my myself i mean i've so again i've been in asia 11 years i've i've been to Pretty much every country in Asia, except for Nepal and Mongolia. Yeah, but I, I've been to North Korea. What? Yeah, I played, oh my God. I played a hockey tournament there. That's crazy. Yeah, I played against their provincial team. Oh uh, wow, I'll, I'll, that's a long story. I'll tell. That, off that's camera. a that's an episode in itself, man. Oh uh, yeah, I could talk about this this experience for twenty thirty minutes. But basically, I. Because I've, I play ice hockey in, in Asia, we're very well connected. So usually I play with these guys up in Beijing called the Beijing North Stars. And because uh, hockey is becoming huge in China now, that they kind of run an organization where all the NHLers that want to come, they organize them to get around China. So like they'll meet Gretzky, the guy that's carrying the cup. I mean, my, my buddy Curtis, he's running it all. So that's one aspect of it. Um, so I'll play with these guys up in Beijing. But the quick trip to North Korea without telling that story is I got connections with a, a team in Tokyo called the Tokyo Canadians. Shout out, shout out to Joji. He's, the, he's running that one. And they just called me up when I was in China and they're like looking for players to go to North Korea. Immediately, I'm like, absolutely, yes. Wow. I'm going. So that was about four, four years ago. And uh, yeah, we played against the North Korean of that province, Pyongyang, uh, the provincial team, and they kicked our ass. What? Yeah, because, well... You got yeah. beat by a bunch of North Koreans? Uh, they, <laughs> so their rink, it's full-size NHL rink, they made us play three 20-minute periods with floods. Really? Oh, it was insane. Wow. And so 
we're okay in the first. None of us could. We're drinking beers on the bench. Kim Jong Un get a hat trick, or no. I mean, how did that go <laughs> no, down? No. <laughs> no, we, or we, he's man in the pipes. You yeah. couldn't get anything by him, man. These kids, because the ice is so big and they're so fast, and like, are well, they all North Koreans? All North Koreans. Wow. Yeah. That's a crazy yeah. experience. Yeah. And we brought gear for them because they're using like 19, their, their keeper, their goalie is using like the old 1980s, like, uh, uh, you know, hockey pads. Like, you know, those like a uh, brown, the brown bait. ones. Yeah. Like, like super so dense. We, we brought them. Uh, I was given, I gave away my, I think my elbow pads when I left the pair of pants. Oh, like, that's cool. Man. Cause they're all, look, they have no equipment there. No, it's it's not as bad as you think, but uh, anyway, so we're going off. Do you know the Seoul team? I I played with the Seoul team in actually I went to Seoul. I played at uh, there's a rink there. Uh, to be honest, I don't remember that okay. trip. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, My buddy was in charge of the Seoul League for a while. Okay, I, yeah, we played in the tournament there, but the problem with the Seoul rink is there's no scoreboard. Oh really? So you, we're we're playing periods and no one has any idea. Like, is there a minute left? Is there That's two minutes wild. Left? But the rink was good. Yeah. And then we ended up going uh, to geckos. No, we went next door to that baseball st- baseball games in Seoul. That's one of my top five things I've ever done in Asia. Yeah. Oh, it's wild. The they got cheerleaders the going. Two teams on each side. Yeah. They're playing there. What was that one song? Oh, fighting! Oh yeah. Oh, yeah, their yeah. songs are. And you you don't know what they're saying, yeah. But by the end of the day, you know the words in Korean, but you don't. You kind of yeah, just yeah. go. You know how to it. sing along. Yeah, yeah Korea is a, ki- a killer place, yeah. man. Yeah, it was. Uh, it's it was one of my it, one of my favorite Asian cities because it was uh, so well developed. Kind of reminded me of like a Taipei or a Hong Kong yeah. in that sense. But and the airports were gorgeous. Like you could have a hot shower. I mean, it's. Yeah, that was great. Yeah, I was there from 94 to 98, man, for the best years of my life. Yeah, and these, uh, obviously, you remember you going down, let's say you're going to the bars, and I think we we're in the university town, and they got the side streets, and walking around to the bars, you're playing in batting cages and different games, like bar hopping. Yeah. It's like an amusement park in the city. Yeah, yeah, it's a, it's a, it's a great, yeah. great place. I love it there. Definitely yeah. be spending some more time there in the coming years for sure. You think so? Um, then uh, H- Haley's family is still there. Like you have to go back to visit. Yeah, them. yeah her mom. Her mom's still there. Um, so that would be great to get back. She has a lot of really close friends there. I still have some friends who live over there, um, and it's just a great place that we haven't really explored in in what it's become. It's changed a lot since we were living there in the nineties, and uh, it's really become a world-class city man and then forget about the city the mountains the countryside there's lots of lots of korea on our on our agenda did you get to travel outside of seoul or have you always kind of been stuck in seoul when you went yeah a little bit outside seoul uh kind of went a bit all over the country but um like down to uh, what is it the island jeju, jeju. we jeju. went to jeju yeah went to the east coast and down the east coast and uh yeah, yeah, had a wild, wild night. Lots uh, of soju. Down there. Lots of soju, yeah, <laughs> yeah, lots of soju. Ended up camping on a beach with, uh, oh, that was a crazy, yeah. crazy night, man. We were, me and my buddy were out with a tent. We used to do a lot of camping, yep. and we were going down the East Coast, and we're out with a tent, and we just shimmy down. We pull over, we're just, we'll just camp. This looks like a gorgeous forest. Shimmy down, come to a fence. It's like, oh, shit. You know, we could hear the water. There's water, and so we go along the fence. We there was a part we could kind of pull the fence back, get through it, get down to the beach. So we did pitch a tent. We uh, just cook up our dinner. This is gorgeous. Nobody here. Deserted beach, and we didn't even know where where we were. It was pitch black when we decided to pull over and do all this. And after dinner, just as we're finishing up two Korean soldiers with like leaves pointed, but like coming out full on machine guns pointed in our faces, yelling at us. Mm. We're like, Holy crap. Like what's going on. And then, it, and you, at this point, do you speak Korean or no idea? A little, like a little, not enough for that situation, yeah. but it turns out that we were on a restricted beach because there's landmines <laughs> because it's too close to North Korea. Yeah. And so they're like, you guys can't be here. And so they, but as often happens in Asia, that story of two idiots, you mm. know, on a beach that could have killed themselves, turns out we're like, oh, 
instead of kind of like the story ending there, it's like, well, well, where can we camp? Oh, the soldiers walked us down to the town. We met the old lady yeah. who runs the nice little restaurant there, and we set up in the public part of the beach, and it turned out to be just an awesome, great night. And that's Asia in a nutshell, right? Yeah. I mean, it's... Um, I find just in general, all of Asia is very hospitable and especially trying to make sure if, if you're a foreigner here that you're going to have a good time and they don't call I've never had too much trouble in Asia, to be honest, like, oh, me especially neither. traveling as well. Oh where, yeah. Where, where else have you been around, uh, Asia? Have you, have you been to China, Taiwan? Been to China a few times for just for work. There's yeah. a, a movie called the great wall over there that we ended up uh, working on. Is that? That wasn't the one with Matt Dean. Yeah, or? yeah, that okay. one. Yeah. yeah, so I went over a year before they started shooting that and then went over uh, a few times subsequent as it got fired up and stuff. And uh, and that was that also had some good Asian stories. Which city was that in? Huarao. It's like oh. they have the, it's, it's about it's on the outskirts of Beijing, kind of a suburb. They have the China Film Group compound, which is this massive film studio, but it's so big that it's empty and like the, it's almost like the like you gotta drive 20 minutes across it type thing mm. and we were all staying there they were shooting there so there's nothing to do and except this one little town and we're the only foreigners in this part of china and so i'm we seeing driving around one night into dinner and i see a local building it says disco and I'm like, that's the building I want to be in. I love an, a, a nondescript Asian city. I've always loved that word, disco. Fun bar, you know, something yeah, simple. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. It's the town disco. So I'm, yeah. we're back shooting pool. I'm like, I'm going to that disco. Anyone want to go? Mm. And the New Zealand guys, the, the, the tactical guys who are training Matt Damon how to hold a gun right and stuff and yelling at him if he does it wrong and all this, the, the army... Uh, consultants i guess they're like oh we went out there like that place is dangerous it's all chinese gangsters you don't want to go there i'm like like what is a chinese gangster gonna do to me nothing they're, nothing they're gonna buy me a drink probably yeah so i'm like are you sure no one wants so i went out by myself an hour after i got in there my table was filled with drinks yeah. they were all lining up trying to buy me drinks because i was the only foreigner in there ended up hanging out met, met a group of them that were awesome talking through google translate all night four in the morning we sh we were the last ones out and then these guys it was great man it was an awesome yeah, that's, night i lived there six years in the same experience when you go out to a bar in china like you could be if you're the only one in there and they see you're, you're alone or whatever they'll invite you to their table and just they won't even let you buy drinks. They'll buy drinks all night. Yeah. And actually the same in if you go to Bangkok or Bangalore Road. Um, see, I speak, my Chinese is, I lived there six years, so it's pretty fluent. Oh, nice. Where so, did you live? Shenzhen. Oh. Yeah, for about six wow. years. Which the reality is, if you live in China, after the first year, you have to learn Chinese or you can't take a taxi. Wow. Like, there's no way to get around. Huh. A lot of the taxi drivers, they come from like rural China. So when they come into the cities, they don't know the city. So you're actually directing them everywhere. And at this point in time, like Google Maps and Maps, nothing sure. worked. So you couldn't just plug it in. But That's a great language to know, man. Yeah, I, for, I would love to be able to speak for Chinese. For me, I, I, I studied it in Taiwan. So when I lived in Taiwan, I went to the university. Again, I, I started teaching English. That's how I first came into it. It was my stepping stone yeah. into Asia. And I went to the university three days a week uh, for a full year because... One of the teachers at my school, he made me do it. He's like, I've been here six years. He's like, it's too late for me, brother. I've lost my chance. But he's like, you, you got to you got to learn Chinese right now. If you don't do it in your first week, you'll never do it. Yeah. And then that's how I picked it up and then moved to, to Shenzhen. Now, Taiwan's like Hong Kong. Yeah. Where everybody speaks English. But then I got to Shenzhen and I'm so glad that I had this foundation. Yeah, that's uh, awesome. Oh, you can't. You can't even go in a restaurant like the menus in Chinese and yeah, you could go to a Western, maybe McDonald's or something, but yeah, it's pretty tricky there. Yeah. Yeah. Nice. So yeah, that was my foray into China just really yeah. for work. And then, um, other parts of Asia. Yep. Yeah, down in, uh, Indonesia, a bit in, in Sumatra. Uh, mm. uh, one of the, the most beautiful place I've ever been was on a place called Lake Toba down in Sumatra. Place is, is heaven on earth. Uh, Borneo. 
was an amazing trip. Did you go hiking in Borneo? There's yeah, that, I uh, climbed the, the mountain. Fam- the famous hike in Borneo, right? I, I climbed, it's called Mount Kinabalu, yeah, tall, the tallest one. peak in Southeast Asia. I yeah. was at, up top of that for a sunrise. That was amazing. And then went up up river into a, into a jungle camp. This was like 98 and uh, was looking for something off the beaten path and found this guy who was, it was supposed to be a, a, a thing where they teach you to survive in the jungle. Mm-hmm. I read about it. I was sitting in Seoul in 98, read about it in a magazine called Action Asia. And again, no internet. I couldn't contact the guy. So I just went there and showed up at his little office in this little town in Borneo. And he's like, oh, no one's ever come to ask for that program i need four people to do that but i i do have a camp and so it was just a wildlife camp um which was awesome four bucks a night all inclusive and did you learn a lot from that experience like if someone threw you let's say in the middle of the jungle in phuket you got that jungle warfare mentality now you could survive or was oh, it kind of oh, just hell a hell no just yeah a, it was just kind of you know scratching the surface yeah just scratching the surface we did go out into the jungle me and this other dude from sweden i think we just did it on our own for a night um but no i couldn't survive it was supposed to be about like we were going to be kind of um you know learning how to hunt the wild boars and get the water from the vines and and there was a a bit of that but no couldn't survive uh, in the jungle but it was a great experience uh, super close to wildlife no running water, no electricity, and I stayed in there a month. Yeah, and it's hard to find those experiences in Asia. They kind of have them, or I, I know they used to have them in like Chiang Mai a lot, where you could go out into these hill tribes, and I honestly, it's more of a tourist trap, to be honest, because yeah. you get out there, and then you, you start wandering around the village, and they got like satellites, and they're watching. Yeah, <laughs> but, yeah. You know, it's just kind of a, a cash cow. Um where are you planning to go first or like what is like your your prime destination that when things open up that this is it this out let's say outside of thailand this is the next spot that's you know in my heart this is where i want to go yeah someone had asked me that i mean we've been chatting korea certainly is is going to be a regular yeah uh, we'll be in and out of korea well i'd, I'd like to go to laos that was going to be our next trip it's amazing. Up to man. Luang Prabang and that area. Amazing. Amazing. Oh, Lao, I did it for 12 days. Yeah. Uh, Luang Prabang is like, you. some people, you could live there. Yeah. It's so gorgeous. But the the best thing in all of Asia, my, my entire time in Asia was in Lao. There's a place up, uh, you can actually access it from Chiang Rai. So you cross the border at Chiang Rai. Uh, it takes 45 minutes. And there's a town in Lao called Hua Sai. And you get there, and they have something called the Gibbon Experience. Have you heard of this? No, nope, no. Nope. Gibbon's the monkeys? Gibbon is the monkey. So it's kind of a refugee for these Gibbon monkeys. They're huge. And a French couple bought the land. Now, you can't book this through tour guides. You'll only know it word of mouth. Yeah. And you get there, and I'll build the story up a bit because it's, it's amazing. So they get there, and then you, and you got to book about four months in advance. They only take eight people a day. Yeah, it's about five hundred bucks per person for two days. I think, to be honest, even one night's enough. But oh, so it's not cheap. Oh, it's not cheap. Yeah, but so uh, you get there, you do your. I, I would say yeah, do two nights. I did the one night because I didn't have time. So you get to Hua Sai, you get to their little like tour guide spot, and then they put you in the back of like kind of a pickup truck, and they're taking you on a dirt road for about four hours into the middle of the jungle. Oh, when nice. you get there, it's not Lao. It's Hmong tribe, if you've heard of the Hmong. No. Nope. The Hmong, they also live in Thailand. They're, the Hmong, if you look back on ancient maps, like we had, you know, the Khmer and the, the Siam, and you had the Hmong. Well, the Hmong are people without a uh, country now. They just live in hill tribes all around Southeast Asia. So when you get there, it's a completely different language. And what this is, is you get there, you get all suited up, and you, you wear, like, what's called... Uh, like zip lining equipment. Yeah. And you just go hiking for about eight hours. Now the hike's very easy. It's not like this. It's just kind of like a Canadian, you know, um, uh, forest, you know, just walking the paths and all that. Yeah. But eventually you get to massive gorges that are like 400 feet long. So how do you get across? You're zip lining across. Oh, wow. So you're hiking and zip lining across this whole jungle. And at the end of the night, 
you zip line into the world's tallest tree houses and you sleep in them. They're about wow. 200 meters up in the, uh, no, maybe 150 feet, something like this up in the air. If, when you go home, just type it in. I had no idea what this was. So I'm in Luang Prabang and I meet a friend and she's talking, yeah, I want to do the Gibbon experience. And uh, she's like, she was working in Manila. She's like, I got to go back to Manila. I can't do it. And I'm like, well, what's the Gibbon experience? She's like, shows me all these pictures. Cause they won't, again, they won't advertise it anywhere. Yeah. Luckily I'm one guy. So I call them up. I'm like, I can be there tomorrow. Do you have space? They're like, we have space for one. I'm like, done. I'm there. I just take three volume. I hop on a bus <laughs> for 15 or 16 hours. Just crazy. Cause I had to go during the night and I'm like, there's no way I'm taking And when you're in Laos, it's crazy. It's just Hills and it's, it, you can get car sick. So yeah. Yeah. Take this up. Driver wakes me up. He's like, you're here. So I left at like, I don't know. 7 p.m., got there at 5 a.m., 6 a.m., waiting on the door. They open the door, th jump in the back of a pickup truck and go off and do this thing and oh, do it for a couple of days and then just cross the border back to Chiang Mai, or Chiang Rai, and flew back home. Oh, that's amazing. Best thing I've done in amazing. Southeast Asia. The best thing I've done. And I've sent, I meet a lot of backpackers here, like when they were here and friends and coming through, and that's where I send them. And then after they do it, they go, that was the best thing I've ever done in my life. That's cool. Yeah, that's yeah. a good tip. Yeah. So yeah, Laos definitely, uh, definitely on the list, and even more so now. That was gonna be the next trip after uh, Korea before this all started. Yeah, and um, Vietnam for sure. Yeah, Vietnam, uh, Spain is on the list. Want to spend some time in Spain? You know, so yeah, lots of places. Yeah, so I I saw on one of your latest uh, videos that you. When you before you went to Canada, you kind of up and sold everything, and you're trying to live out of the backpack essentially now and go uh, be minimalist. The fifty year old's backpack, which is two hard suitcases. Right. So how is that going to work um, for your lifestyle? Are you planning to just Airbnb as you go around place yeah. to place? Do you have uh, now? I know you're mm. going to Koh Samui, and then you're going to go to Bangkok. Are you going to like? Will Bangkok kind of be a hub for you or? Not really. No, no. We're just one way tickets. So there's no hub right now. Um, and, you know, we're not sure how long we'll like it for. The start is great. And the reason why is, first of all, yeah, we got rid of most of our crap. We got down to two suitcases each. And then we, you know, had like 20 five boxes of stuff that we couldn't really part with that's sitting in a storage locker in Bangkok. We already both forgot what's in like most of those boxes. Yep. So it's like, whoa, what's even in there? Why did we keep, we don't even know what's there anymore. Souvenirs maybe. Or yeah, no, that we did ship another like 10 boxes of that back to Canada to just, that's going to be there forever. This stuff is stuff we thought we might need. If I guess if we ever got a condo or, or a place in Bangkok or Thailand to live like a 12 month lease, then this stuff would come in handy. And so, so we thought, uh, let's just try it and see what it's like. And, and our first foray is here in Phuket right now. We're like only 10 days into it and we're staying at an awesome place. And we thought, you know, it, 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 what we're paying is we, we just set a monthly rent budget. And for us, it turns out to be like, it's a hundred bucks a night. Yeah. So 3000 bucks a month. That goes really far. Here. It goes really far. And, but it, it, we couldn't have done that if we had a 12 month lease. If we had a place in Bangkok as a hub that we were paying for, we'd be sitting here stressing going, well, we can't stay here forever. Yeah. Like we got to get back. This is costing us. Now it feels like our, our room here is free because it's just mm. rent. So that part of it, that's just, that's just living. Then we're going to go to Samui, then Bangkok, then Chiang Mai, and wherever we are, if we stick within that budget, it, like the traveling part, it's, it doesn't cost us anything is how we're looking at it. It's just... Do, do you have like a, a plan like outside of this kind of, let's say, 50-year-old backpacker saying, okay, we're going to do this for 12 months, and then let's think about settling down, or is it very no. open? No, definitely open. Yeah. Like we, we weren't sure if it would last a month or 10 years. Yeah. And we still aren't. We're only 10 days into it. So far, we love it. It's, it it'll probably last a couple of years at least. Uh, but then we don't know. Maybe it'll be, you know, uh, just uh, something that something that I think that that lifestyle is doing nothing but getting easier as all these platforms open up and 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 as the world kind of 
goes more remote workers and, and, you know, makes it easier for that lifestyle. Now, with that lifestyle in mind, are you able, now because you've just started it, do you have the mentality like you're on a permanent vacation? Are you able to separate that? Like, no, this is now, this is my life. Wherever I go, that is my home. And separating it from the yeah. vacation mentality. You ask good questions, man, because that's what we were asking ourselves. That mm. was my fear personally, because for me, like this whole YouTube channel has become a, like a job. Like I put in hours, yeah. man, like 50 hours a week easy. I love it, but it's still hours. And so I thought to myself exactly that. Well, I f uh, how am I going to be able to separate this when I'm in Bangkok, just living life? It's easy to say I'm not going out today. I'm sitting in the edit bay. I'm gonna I'm gonna pound out ten hours of editing. But when there's so much fun stuff going on, <laughs> and I'm in wherever I might be, because you're in a new place. I'm in a new place, and so I was really worried about that. So far, so good. I've been able to manage that here because the mentality has been naturally like like yeah this is we're not in any rush to go and make sure we tick all these boxes and do all these things it's like i gotta edit i have to get a video yeah. out i want to get a video out this is i'm just living could the concept of your budgeting you're budgeting on expenses um for for rent but taking in the concept of budgeting and on t on time as well and yeah. how to apply that because a lot of people don't take that variable into consideration anyone can budget expenses but how do you budget your time yeah meaning okay you're out here today that's your time and you're and thanks for coming on and it's it's helping us and we hope to give your viewers some content as well sure, to learn more chat. yeah <laughs> to learn man. about you and especially two people that have lived in asia so long it's easy to have we're, you know we're not green yeah um have you planned out a budget of your time during these when you're running around because, and it, sorry, I always say this, they hate me for it. It gets long winded. Yeah, yeah. But no. um, you are going to lose time as you travel because that's part of your time budget. Yeah. Moving from place to place and setting up and unpacking and hanging your shirts up. Now you're not doing that when you're living and in a doing home. stuff. Yeah. And, and doing, doing stuff. and doing yeah. stuff because we are in a new place for sure. So it's, a, yeah, again, great question. And so, like, the way I look at that, as far as time management goes now is it's almost like I look at things in three hour blocks and it's like, you know what? Like I, cause, cause that's how I look at it and it all backtracks from editing. Yeah. So if I, if I can, I can do a lot in a three hour block, especially when I'm doing a YouTube video that doesn't have to adhere to, you know, time constraints, rules, anything really, I can make it whatever I want. So a three hour block, I can, I can edit most of my videos in, in three, three hour blocks. And, uh, so it's like, Hey, I gotta, I gotta find a three hour session. I'll just call it a session. And that can also mean then, then I started thinking, okay, great. So if that's going to be, I don't know, after lunch today, you know, my wife and I kind of gets hot here. It's like, we're fine to chill anyway. She's chilling, uh, at the place and, uh, maybe having a nap or just, just, just kind of chilling when it's too hot out for, for her and. Okay, I'll put in a three-hour session, but that gives us another three-hour chunk there in the morning. Oh, let's go. Okay. Let's go do stuff. And so we have. We've been out doing tons of stuff. And you can, you can like, that's that's a lot when it's hot and you're getting old like like us, man. So it's like. And you're planning around the time of day, too, with the sun. Yeah, <laughs> you, for sure. You're not, you don't want to be at the beach at, you know, noon. Not for us. No, like we're no. not, we're not, we're not sun seekers but anymore. I'm, pr I'm pretty white. <laughs> yeah, exactly. You got full chi I haven't had pants on in years, <laughs> man. Like, yeah, you know. Yeah. So I'm not for the, if you're a sun seeker, you're just a different story. Yeah. You could sit around the beach all day and, and there's nothing better for us. That's not uh, something that's, that's, that's desired. It's always there if you need it anyways. Yeah. Right? Yeah. For us, the beaches that you go for a walk, like three hours on a beach, you'd be like, well, that's a long time on a beach, man. Yeah, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm the same. I, to be, to be honest, I get, I can't even lay on the beach. I, I'm, I'm a crazy workaholic. I'm always, yeah. I got to be doing something. Yeah, I'm always yeah. on the move. But um, with 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 that in mind and understanding your your putting your time into two blocks of of three, how does that work with your? Um, let, let's focus on your YouTube creative process. Um. When you're you're going to make a video and and you're doing about what one a week, two a week on average. Two a week now so, was three a week. Which, now two. That's a lot. And mm -hmm. we we 
we started a, not a vlog, we were doing a web series, but we've only filmed one. Uh, it's called People of Phuket, and this style is more um, kind of a documentary style about the people. That, so it'll be about people that come on the podcast. Yeah. And then we're going to do a story about them. So that like you can watch the story about them, more focused on the lifestyle, but there's you know a lot of B rolls, docu series style about that person, and then that can connect to the podcast, and you get both aspects. That's cool. Of it. Um, but when you're getting in, into your videos, what is your creative process of? Okay, I need to do a video. I need to do some brainstorming. Where do you start? How do you come up with these ideas? What's your direction? Yeah, yeah, it's. Um it, 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 it starts with what, what the concept, I guess. And then there's different styles. Sometimes it's super planned out and, and almost fully scripted. Like if, 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 it, if it needs to deliver a lot of information that's concise and accurate, like the news program. I that just, one, yeah. I say, I say news, but it's like it's, uh, it's, it's not uh, really earth-shattering, uh, groundbreaking investigative reporting. Yeah. But, but that one uh, takes a lot of planning. It takes a lot of scripting to be able to edit back and forth with the multiple characters all played by myself. And then there's other ones like some, and it's funny, YouTube's a crazy game, man, because some of my biggest viewed videos are ones that like... The one that actually launched my channel, I was a couple months in and I and I didn't want to make a video, but I had to make a video. I'm like, oh, I got to I got to go to the hospital today. Get, I was in Samui. I had an ear thing from scuba diving. I got to go get my ear checked. Oh, screw it. I'll, I'll just make a video of me going and get my ear checked and yeah. that'll be it. Who cares? At least I'm doing it. And then that video blows up. It goes all over to the ties are sharing it up in Bangkok and stuff. So sometimes the more planning I do, I think it's going to be this crazy thing. Everyone's going to love this, man. Yeah. And then other ones where I just kind of walk down the street and and there's no planning involved and it just kind of happens naturally. Um, so it's those are the two ends of the spectrum of how it's planned. And then the editing just has to be a commitment. You know, and the one thing, like if, if YouTube was, was a business, the one thing I would think for... for I guess for my channel and probably many channels would be the, uh, uh, an editor would free up so much time. Like if I had an editor, <laughs> this guy, <laughs> the amount, I was saying that today to Haley. If I, if all I had to do was shoot videos, it's like I, I could make so many videos and make people sick. But when you're shooting uh, and it's only cause we're, we're new to this. He actually, Delise has been doing it a while. I'm new to this. But you don't realize that when you're shooting, you need to be shooting with editing in, with editing in mind. Oh yeah, because you're, it, you 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 could go shoot twenty hours and that's great. All right, good luck, editor. Put that together. Where do I start? Oh yeah, no, no. Everything has to there has to be has to connect, and the only way it's going to connect is if it connects in the shot. And then the editor pieces it together, and then, and then it flows from, from one end all yeah. the way to the other. If it's just a mad jumble of snippets, that's what I call like a, uh, a video postcard. And there's a lot of travel YouTube channels that would f fall into that category, which I certainly don't want to be that, mm -hmm. where it's just a video postcard. There's no connection. There's no thought being put yep. into how these things connect in the edit while it's being shot. Why do you think your followers, subscribers, why do they follow you? What? Because there's a lot of vloggers out there we can get into. I follow uh, Chad, CV Media. Yeah. I, I like his content. He's a good guy. I really like his content. Uh, Chad, uh, come and do his show, man. He should talk to you. Let's go, Chad. <laughs> I got another girl that I met. Her name's Marta Selsky. She has, she's Polish. Yeah. Uh, apparently, she knows Chad as well. I had a, a meeting with her. Um, she's 30,000 subs, and she's on the island, too. And, okay. Um, and then you, you have guys like Esquire. Yeah. I'm sure you've heard of him. LJ. Yeah. And then there's another couple here on the island called Maybella. Richie, Richie and, and Maybella. May Bella. Yeah. Those are kind of the only ones that I'm aware of that I, I watched, and it seems they're doing well in the algorithm rhythm um but back to the question it's what is it about your channel and i'm sure you get this from your subscribers why do they watch you what are you doing that's so unique that connects with them and keeps that retention and keeps them coming back yeah 
Yeah, I mean, uh, I I don't know for sure. I I certainly think um, editing the 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 work I put into editing and my background. I had a bit of a, of of a background in editing in a previous in in the early part of my film career. I did a stint as an on set editor. Excuse me, the Leo's getting to me, but that. Uh, <laughs> If you, but, uh, if you need another, we'll get one in a second. <laughs> <laughs> but that uh, the editing, yeah. I think is is key. I think um, it's 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 a lot more watchable when when things move along uh, quickly. And you know, I, I'm not afraid to show my passion, like for Thailand and for and I know I've always loved making videos. So I think that the, the there's a genuine passion that I have for for the country of Thailand and for making silly videos and for just wanting to, you know, make put have someone watch yeah. that and be like of crack a smile and have a nice thought and maybe remember something about Thailand themselves. I think that connects with people that love Thailand. Either they've been here, you know, they live here or they want to come here. There's some sort of connection to that. Yeah. Um, and, and for the ones that have been here and, and cannot travel during these times, it, you know, it's that, that feeling. It's very nostalgic. Oh, I remember that that road. I mean, I see you You were living on, what, 20, 23, right? Yeah. Okay, 23, 23. 23. And, yeah, I'm sure everyone's been there. So when they're filming, it's like, you know, you bring them back to that experience yeah. like people have with smells and tastes. You're doing this visually, essentially. Yeah, and at the same time, immersing into the country, right? Like, which which I, actually other people do do that as well. Like, I'm certainly not alone in that uh, regard, but it's what mm -hmm. I enjoy most about it. It's not just like beautiful, like I said, video postcards, beautiful drone shots of Chuang and this is this and this is that. And then it's just like, that's Chuang or something. It's more like with a, with a, with a guy here on the side of the road, you know, selling yeah. whiskey and what do you, you pouring it into a coconut and then what, what's going on? Okay. But like this, this yeah. is, this is like, let's immerse ourselves in this country, which I think can only be done by living here and, and, and because you get many travel vloggers that come through, but they're going to show you the big Buddha, co Yeah, 48 hours in. Postcards. Yeah. Stuff. But I think for me personally, why I started watching you, number one, it's the flow and the editing is done very well. And I, I didn't realize you came from a media background. Now, when I watched Chad, that's why I watched Chad because he comes from a media background. Sure. So I said, this is why his content works so well. Yeah. And it's very, now we're, we are not vloggers. We don't want to be vloggers. We, we want to focus on this. But after watching, like getting into this and watching yours and Chad's, I go, there's not a chance we could be that creative and have that editing skill at that level. Because the way, like watch, again, yours or Chad's, the, the cuts, the flow, it just, it's nonstop, it's engaging and it's a 10 minute video and the next thing you know, it's done. Yeah. Other vloggers, you can see, it, they, they don't have the same flow. So I think, as, as a fan, because again, I'm saying I'm watching it during lunch, I think it's quite interesting that it's, it's very authentic and you're kind of showing the lens of an expat in Thailand outside of the typical spots, very off the beaten path. And you're doing things that are um, different that maybe an expat would actually do living here. Like, for example, um, you did a video I watched. I watched this one today. I thought it was interesting where you went to Mark Weens, Mark Weens uh, to visit the Pad Kapow guy and, and eat that food. But like that's something so unique that a vlogger traveling here, that's just not something they're going to do. Yeah. And even though it's so simple, it's being immersed in that journey. Okay, now we're going down the street and pointing things out along the way and and, and building us up to what's about to happen of that experience. Yeah. And anyway, that, that's from, from, from me uh, as a viewer. I love to hear it because, the, you know, the goal of my channel is to hopefully allow people who love this country. And, you know, I came to Thailand every year since 94 and 15 years in, but I came for two weeks at a time and I went to the same spots and I... You know, and and my my view on Thailand was very limited, and then it and so it strikes me like I'm probably not the only one. There's probably a, a thousands and thousands of people who come to Thailand for their vacation every year, and you know, 
and and see the same things. And so for me to start cracking open and peeling the, the layers of the onion back for myself and to share that with people, to hear that that's connecting with people like you, like I want people to, to, to know that it's there and mm-hmm. to then come and start experiencing it themselves. And that's like the whole goal of the channel is people can come and, and start to start to get out of their comfort zones and into some back alleys that they might have previously for whatever reasons not explored. Yeah. I, what I, I think it's interesting about it. It's that most of these off the beaten path experiences, it can only come from word of mouth, meaning you show up at Kosamui, you go to the bar and you meet a local and he's going to tell you the off the beaten path stuff, but you're delivering that like digitally and internationally. So these people that aren't even here yet, they don't need to go to the bar, land here, figure shit out. They can kind of just watch your YouTube and find a, a lot of things that they would have no idea even exist. Yeah, which is awesome, no, right? A, so to me, like, that's that's the power of this world we're living in now. This connected world has a tons of positives, tons of negatives, but but the power of it's crazy. Like you're saying, it's like... It's it's like I like, like that's a great analogy, man. I'm like that guy in the bar who says, "Have you heard about this just over there? Like yeah. you should check that out." Like the person who told you to go to the Gibbon experience. It's the same thing, you know. Yeah. It's to be able to do that. Yeah, it's it's, it's on a digital yeah, platform. It's, that's, it's wild. That's, that's pushed out. It's wild. Now, th- through that experience, and do you? I don't want to say I don't believe in competitors. I I really don't like this word. I think there's enough pie for everybody. Sure. Um. In in your world, are, are there any other people like you at this level? Now, Chad, he's he started doing it, but he's gone back to the tr- the automotive so- side. Like, he and did, he's gonna blow up with that when the world opens up, man. Like, he's, because he, he's doing something very unique, yeah, but he, he's experienced in that. Yeah, he has. He yeah. Oh, exactly, man. He he has a long history in that. He's he. he and he'd be the first to tell you he's not a Thailand vlogger. And when the world opens up and he takes his, sh- his show on the road to Tokyo, to Dubai, yeah. to the Philippines, to all these places that have crazy motorsports cultures. Yeah. Yeah. Fast and Furious, man. That's one of the world's biggest franchises in history for a reason. Yeah. He's the YouTube version He's gonna bl- he's gonna blow up. Yeah, because he can. Anyone can bring content for the U.S., but he can travel the world, and it's it's another piece. It's a, a another way to, if, especially if you're into the automotive side, which I'm not. I actually followed Chad because I loved his motor motorbike trips. Yeah, yeah, they're awesome. Those are awesome. Yeah, because they're great. especially places like I love motorbike trips. So when he goes through Isan on 13 days, I'm watching that because I want to do that. Yeah. And it kind of, you know, he shows you the journey along the way. But yeah, he will blow up when he's able to get out to these other countries. And and you're providing content that differentiates you from someone in the US. And same for someone like yourself. But back to this question, it's, is there anyone like you in Thailand or maybe South Korea or other Asian countries doing something similar? Yeah, I don't, I, I don't know. I mean, I would, I, uh, as far as I know, like I don't really watch much other Thailand content, to be honest, just because I'm, I'm busy. spend a lot of time. I'm busy. I make it. And when I'm watching YouTube, I'm watching different content than Thailand content. I live in Thailand and, and, uh, and yeah, and I make, spend a lot of time making Thailand ta- content. So I'm watching just different stuff. What channels are you watching? I watch like I'm I'm I come from the film industry. I like guys like Peter McKinnon, you know, um, a lot of those photography, videography mm. channels, how to be a better editor channels, tricks of how to do this and that in the edit bay. There's always stuff to be learning on YouTube. And then I'll watch a bunch of stupid crap, man, <laughs> like big waves crashing into boats. <laughs> oh, there we go. An hour later. Oh, look at that wave, man. That thing's huge. Huge, you know, cute, and just cute, stupid stuff. Cute puppies. Yeah, running. yeah. I don't know. You yeah. name it. Like the stuff I'll get in. It is bizarre, but uh, Leaf, leaves highlights of them. Oh, leaves highlights. Yeah. Well, for sure. Every 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 after game interview. Oh. Um, yeah, all kinds of that stuff. Did you watch the? Have you watched the preseason at all? They won. The I first. haven't seen any games. Uh, no. Oh, they did. They they did okay. They won the first, but yeah. I'm I'm a Leaf fan well my whole life and oh you are oh, oh dude ha- so how, 
Well, I let's commiserate, oh. man. Can yeah, another Leo, please, yeah, sir. We need another. Yeah, we do. <laughs> I'll, I'll get one in a sec. But it's no. oh my well, god. Well, the thing with them is, it's like, it's like, does the do, how can we enjoy regular season success anymore? Oh. How 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 can the after last year, after years and decades and lifetimes, how can we enjoy? regular season success will we i ask myself we could finish 82 and 0 and i don't have confidence in the playoffs <laughs> I, did, I did a leafs <laughs> podcast that's how i started when i got to asia and got bored yeah. first before the youtube i did a leafs podcast for a season here or what, what do yeah, you mean in bangkok that? so you were was it video or just no just, just audio? audio and you're just yeah. talk, you're just leaf talk international it was oh, just God. me and my buddy in in tokyo okay. after uh, once a week we'd get on and dissect the uh <sighs> the debauchery that they that they call hockey and they're, they're just a bad they're a girlfriend that's horrible that you keep taking back yeah oh yeah yeah <laughs> exactly and and uh and and i say how can i enjoy regulars to talk to me in three weeks man <sighs> we're gonna win this is awesome H how do you watch the the leafs at home do you have the nhl app yeah nhl.tv yeah, it's terrible on, um, so what I do, I have it on my phone, right? And mm -hmm. then I Chromecast it. Have you ever tried this? No. Or how do you, how do you connect? I, I watch it on my Apple TV. There's an app. I'm an idiot. Okay. I should do that. There's an app called that they have and you log in there, but, and then, but, and my buddy just watches it on his, uh, lap and his computer screen. Do you get, are you getting lagging? Like my lagging is insane. No, I think it's, for, oh, that's what I got to do. I got to put the app on the TV because I got the app on the phone and I Chromecast out and like, it's horrific. And and if you Chromecast other stuff, it's no, fine. Yeah, everything else is fine. It's oh, just this weird. NHL app. Huh. So I think I got to put the, yeah, put the app on the TV. Yeah, that works great for me. That's for me, I what I do it. is, I'm well, you saw my desk downstairs. I just got hockey going from the second I wake up till about lunch. I'm watching, I got big into the Sharks yeah. because of the... San Jose? Yeah, San Jose. Oh, boo. Well, I, I got to follow... I, <laughs> I got to follow two disappointing teams, all right? I'm not Have gonna, you ever been to the Sharks? No, or, I've never been. It's the saddest... Well, they got Neil Young. Lamest place really? on earth. I went to the, one of the last hockey games I ever went mm. to was in San Jose. I, f I almost stood up in the middle of the game. Me and my buddy were like, we we after the game, he's like, did you feel the same way? Didn't you want to stand up and just tell all those people? Like, what's wrong with you people? They're not getting into it? or Oh, dude. They are like, it is so lame. Uh, we were sit uh, at one point, we were sitting up in our seats. Yeah. And um, excuse me, uh, can you please sit back in your seats? Uh, and we're like, what? What's going on? And then they, and then they did it again, and to another guy. And this guy, and I won't say it on your show, yeah. family friendly show and all. But this guy starts yelling and yelling at him. Yeah. And this was against the Leafs, obscenity lace tirade. Like, well, I'm just sitting back in my seat. And so then I go out to get a drink or something, and this this lady's talking to the to the security, saying, and then he was sitting forward in his seat and then he called me a yeah and yeah. i won't say the word and so then i go back i start telling this story to my buddy over the loudspeaker uh excuse me uh, ladies and gentlemen it would be appreciated if you would all sit back in your seats to enjoy the game what is it, the opera and we're like what is going on here and then a power play comes and they all start going like this and it's just like man i'm like this is ridiculous. Well, probably a lot of the fans they don't play hockey, right? So, yeah, like they're they're there for the. It's more That's the entertainment, it. It, and it, they are a good team. Yeah, they're, they're likable team. They had some great players. They unfortunately didn't get it done. we pick. Well, we pick up. All, we love picking up the old guys. That's all. Gary it's. Roberts, Marlo, oh, Thornton. Sure. What are Thornton. the Spetsas? Spetsas, Spetsas didn't. Spetsas done well. is it's all maybe we our best player. It's all we can afford, <laughs> man. It's all we can afford. We're yeah. all tied up in Mitchie. Yeah, I, I didn't like the trade with Bozak. I, I thought he was one of our best players. But yeah. We can't pay him. Yeah, no, so. can't pay him. No. Anyways, I, I could talk about this for hours. I my, my worst Leaf experience, and I'm sure you know the same, is Game 7, Boston. You remember? Oh, oh dude, are you kidding? I'm with my buddy. We're watching it in China. 
we're having coffees and Baileys, and it's seven in the morning because it's China. And oh, party he, time, he's, man! He's got the horn going because party time. We're crushing it. We're going. We're beating. I got Boston. a. I got a photo. I was at a lame ass dinner with our investors the night we closed the venture capital firm was that night we're at this lame ass dinner but it was in toronto so even them everyone wanted to watch yeah. uh and and i got a picture of me and my buddy like this or whatever it was three one or four one. yeah we're like that's it man it's over <laughs> those last three minutes when they were down by two goals i gave i'm like oh they lost yeah the pressure they put on it was just like this is we're not winning there's just no way yeah i it got was, a video that you'll like that's gonna come out uh that's leaf related that's gonna be great but uh mm. it's not coming out until 2024 2024 yes, what yes. is this I, I shot it uh back in 99 it's the final night of maple leaf gardens oh, okay and i was outside and I made a video that would fit in quite well on my channel. It's just, uh, it's a vlog that I shot mm. of that night before there was YouTube. So why 2024 then? What's to be the 20, I'm going to put it out on the 25th gotcha. anniversary and no one knows that. So don't yeah. tell anybody. Yeah, don't, 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 don't tell don't, anybody. Don't worry. We, we don't have many subs right but, now. So but that right. will come out on the 25th anniversary yeah. and the footage is nuts. Yeah. I, I went, I went to the garden, but I was like. I think eight or nine. So I don't really oh, yeah, remember. Oh yeah, because you're so young. I'm 35. I'm I not that young. I was there when Dougie did the back around the net. I was behind the net. Was that was that game seven? No, game against seven. St. Louis. That was against St. Oh, Louis. Yeah, you don't want to talk about the Gretzky game. No, no, I was I was at that whole series too. Holy I shit. went to every one of those games, man. See, I was probably what was that? That's 93. Oh, so I'm like eight. Yeah, so, yeah. I yeah. kind of remember, but not. Yeah, too much. I was 22. I was going to every game uh, yeah. at, that, at that time. McSorai, oh. man. McSorai. Yeah, they're, they're just a <laughs> bunch of bums. Bunch yeah. of bums. Um, yeah, that's a thing. We probably, we, next time, we'll just do a podcast on the Leafs. <laughs> <laughs> How disappointing they are. Um, I, I wanted to, to, again, dive into the YouTube side. And I think it's more because your channel it is doing quite well and you haven't been along around that long let's say what a couple a year and a half couple two year years and a half year and a half yeah would you say that predominantly has to do also with the current situation and the fact that just people can't travel here so they're living through you vicariously it's interesting you say that because um certainly it was the perfect storm of being able to kind of establish i guess a, a, a subscriber base, which what YouTube refer to it. I like to call it just a community, but a subscriber base because of that. And because people were stuck indoors, not only because they couldn't travel, like they couldn't leave their house. Yeah. So I can only imagine YouTube viewership skyrocketed. And then you add that to not being able to travel and the Thailand lovers suddenly were searching Thailand. Let me, yeah. let me at least see Thailand I just had to cancel my trip. Let me see it. So, yeah. And then at the same time as that, no one was allowed in. So the only Thai vloggers that were going to broadcast Thailand to the world were the ones that are here. So there was no new competition coming in to show Thailand. So it was. The, I think it had a part to play for sure in that. But then I also think, like, what's the next chapter look like? What is What does it look like? Like my channel's all about Thailand in a world where zero people come here. What is it? What is it? What happens to it? And I don't know the answer, but what happens to it in a world where there's a 40 million people a year coming here? There's a lot more people at that point. These are the, these are the casual Thailand people that are like, and if they haven't booked a plane ticket, they're watching something else on YouTube. Mm -hmm. But if they book their plane ticket to Thailand, things to do in Thailand like that's going to be a whole other animal that I have no idea because I haven't, I haven't been able to experience that. But on your channel, like, and again, I'm, I'm kind of just brainstorming, thinking off the top of the head, um, that because you offer that off the beaten path content, that word of mouth would be very powerful for your channel. Meaning like any, again, anyone can watch the postcard content, go to big Buddha, go to Costa Muti, Here's this beautiful beach, whatever. But as word of mouth would come out about your channel, go watch this guy. Cause he's going to show you something that no one else can show you. And maybe you can find some content in there that, you know, right back to the Mark Wien's example of 
well, following that, okay, I want to go eat pad kapow at that place. Sure. Things like this. And instead of trip advisor, where to eat. Yeah. Yeah. So it's another way to look at it. I agree. And that's where I say it's going to be just super interesting for me to mm. see what that world looks like as it pertains to just my channel and, and Thai YouTube channels. I think there'll be some Thai YouTube channels that, 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 uh, do worse in the, in the opened world, uh, when people are off their couches and able to experience the world. And I think there'll be some Thai channels that do better in the open world where people are, where there's again, 3 million people a month getting on a plane and coming here and looking yeah. for stuff to do. Yeah. And looking and, and there is an audience that is looking off the beaten path. There is the audience that wants to just, you know, give me the tourist trap stuff. Oh, for sure. Then, yeah. For example, yeah. you are your own audience essentially yeah. think in that, in that yeah. sense. I would agree. Yeah. Yeah. And there is, there's, there's, there's definitely both audiences. Yeah. And I think, uh, yeah, it's just going to be interesting. It's like a big science experiment, man. And I'm, I'm curious to see what yeah. happens. Well, you're, now you're talking about, you don't know the future for, for Thailand vloggers in general, but like, what is the future for you and your channel and your content? Do you, do you kind of just come up with it week by week or do you have an overall like a uh, plan, like a year plan of where you see yourself taking this and what you see yourself doing with it? Not really, because part of it depends on, what's going on with Haley and I in our life, mm. you know, it could end abruptly if we decide to, if like we said to our daughter, Hey, you, you want us to live in Toronto while you're going to university. So, so we're not half a world away from you say the word. Yeah. She's like, um, no. <laughs> and, but, but if she had said yes, well, YouTube channel's done. I'm, I'm going back to being retired working for me <laughs> at <laughs> you, that point. You could do it from there as well. Yeah, yeah. maybe, yeah. maybe. I don't know if I would, but, but, um, so, you know, that's just an illustration of, of that. I don't know exactly where it's going, but it's partly dependent on what I'm doing. I, I won't do it if it's not something that I enjoy doing. So and the passion's still there. You you every week you you have the passion to I want to create. Oh, I episode. love it, man! It's, it's like it's like crack. Yeah, it's like crack, man. <laughs> it's not something like I have to make a video. No, sometimes it is, but mm. that's part of the gig. I can't expect it to be like yeah. like crack. I would imagine crack to a crackhead. I'm sure it's is, great. Is awesome most of the time, yeah. but not all the time. Don't do drugs in school. No, B I S kids. Definitely <laughs> don't do crack. But if you were a crackhead, yeah. then I'm sure. Sometimes it's like, ah, I don't really want to, but I have to, but then, you know, and so, but, but, but yeah, no, it's all, and, and it's going to be important to me long-term to continue loving it. And that means that it, it's like a compliment to my life that we're choosing Haley and I, as opposed mm. to it choosing our life. Where does your satisfaction come from? Does it come from just creating the content or does it come from these, um, real time, um, uh, self-satisfaction in terms of likes and shares. Yeah, both, both, both. not so much likes, but more people that <clears throat> there's t more tangible things than a like. It's people that have engagement, I'm saying. engagement, engagement, people that have said, I, I I'm in Thailand right now because of you, man. Like mm. that is wild. It's just, it's just wild to think about. I'm retiring in Thailand because of you. I've always kind of thought about it, but now I just did it. And so that end of the engagement is part of it. And just making videos, man. Like in the 90s, I have, I, I've, I made videos exactly like this mm -hmm. for uh, a few years. There was, there was just no YouTube. There was nowhere to put them. But I have, I have shoeboxes full of them. I've always loved it. And then I got away from it. And now I'm, it's a passion. It's a, I just love it. So every week when you're creating that episode, you're brainstorming a uh, process. Are you throwing ideas like on a, a whiteboard at a wall before you choose one? Or how would that come together before? Like, for example, I'm as you were with Sean yesterday. Is that going to be an episode? Like nope. you put that was no, just that a was live just stream. Live, yeah. live stream. Yeah. Do you have stuff stuff planned for next week, or is there a nope. day you sit down and start to think about it? No, uh, no, not really. Like, there's some stuff that so so I'll have. It's not. It's a digital version of a whiteboard. 
Like I'll I'll think of something that I th- like. I've had an idea. I've had some ideas for since a year and a half since I started that I still haven't done yet. Mm. Um, that I have on a digital version of a whiteboard. This list of oh that'd be a cool video. That'd be. But then week to week as I as I go through it, I never really have more than the next week. Excuse me again. Week planned out. So right now. The next video I'm going to make, it comes out tomorrow, was just a day in the life. Haley said, you, we should, you should just show them a day in the life of the Phuket sandbox to let people know what it's like. Like, mm-hmm. a lot of people think the whole island shut down, man, and it's like there's just a bunch of people weeping in the streets. Why don't you show them what we're doing? So that's tomorrow's video. And then... And that, the filming's done. The, yeah, and edit, editing's done. done. Yeah. Ju- just uploaded it before coming here. Yeah. And then after that, it was like, okay, so what's next? And then there is one that just kind of surfaced with Sean again. And it's, but that was supposed to be today. This was what I was going to do today. And then we got rained out. Oh, okay. Sean has boats. Boats don't like rain. Yeah. This video, and it might happen Sunday now. And it's going to be the next, but that just came about because a few days ago, he told me a story when we were out for dinner I'm like, well, that sounds awesome, man. Can I come? I want him to do a video of that. Yeah. And so that's how that one's going to And By the way, can I do this along? And he's like, he's an awesome guy. Yeah. And so that's how that one's going to happen. There's a pay it forward coming up in Samui that's been in the works for a month because it takes a lot of groundwork. That's going to come up in a f- couple of weeks. Mm-hmm. But other than that, yeah. It, it, so again, some of them sit on a whiteboard for a year. Some of them happen like with an idea in the morning and then some of them are kind of in between where it's like a few days out it all starts to percolate because i'm assuming some of those bigger ones you know if i take this on this is going to be time consuming compared to okay i can do this a bit quicker yeah oh yeah definitely like when prioritizing yeah for sure and then there's one there's some that are kind of scheduled like i want to do one of these pay it forward videos every month that's something that's a monthly thing. And then it also seems like a lot of the, the, the YouTubers uh, like yourself that are vlogging, there is a recipe, meaning like uh, condos, how to spend $5 challenges in sure. a day. And like you recycle those every six months or because you know those are going to get the most views. Is there, does that process and mentality come into play? A, a little bit. Um yeah, like like for me, the condo tours is something like, I mean, Haley and I have always been interested in real estate. Yeah. It's it's the reason I've been able to retire. It's And so it's something that's always interested us, even when we were never in the market for a house. Sometimes on the weekend in Toronto, we'd be like, let's just go look at some open houses for shits and giggles and see what's out there. What, see what's what, going on. What, how much yeah. it costs. Could we rent it? Could it do like just, just, it's just been an interest. So that's something that I love to see and I love to, sh- and I figure there's a lot of people that do. Mm-hmm. And so I don't want to just keep showing the same things in Bangkok, but if I go to a new place and it, actually I didn't even do it when I was here, I would have loved to have known Haley and I were talking about it. And she told me today, oh, there's villas. I saw what those are renting for and what these are renting for. It's just an interesting, people are interested. What can you get for the well, money? Well, because everything's gone down by like 20%. Like even this place here, um, like I've been in the market to buy. Yeah. But it doesn't make sense right now. because oh, really? the Well, the rent is so, so cheap and I'm on the fence of moving to Europe. Actually, that was my plan. I want to move to Portugal. Oh. Um, eventually, well... A year, well, two years ago now. That's obviously not happening. Happening because if you move to Portugal and buy a home, I can get rid of my Canadian passport and really? I get a Portuguese passport, and now I can live in all of Europe with no problem. Oh wow! And but you can't do that and keep your Canadian passport. I don't think so. No, I don't oh. think you can have dual. Oh really? But, uh, so I, that's an option I'm thinking about. Uh, just because, and I won't go into that. Just the way Canada is right now, it's a bit funny. But um, anyways. I wanted to ask your advice if uh, there's someone that's, you know, looking to be an upcoming YouTuber. So I, I have a friend, actually, he helped with this podcast at the beginning. His name's Callum Platt. He's he's trying to do some YouTube in the fitness space, but now he's getting into, he has a channel out there. So shout out to him. It's called The Beachcomber. And is there any advice to a new YouTuber getting into, now we would call it like lifestyle vlog, right? Sure. 
Um, any advice you would give them to starting up? The do's, the don'ts, you know, red flags, things that you wish you would have known at the beginning hmm. as well? Yeah. Um, yeah. It's funny, like when you have a channel that kind of pops f- for whatever reason, you, you it doesn't... I, I don't feel like it makes me an expert. I feel like it makes me lucky. But at the same time, I think, yeah, a couple of things like... First of all, if there's an aspiring YouTuber like that's afraid to start, that would be the biggest piece of advice. Like just just start. Like don't wait anymore. Like don't don't pretend like your your video has to be perfect. My first video is is, is, is live from yeah. my laptop, little camera on my laptop, just uh, doing push ups. Just just start and 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 focus on improving getting better don't think that you have the magical formula you know like i've i've seen some people that that think their formula is just magical so they've they're like they hone in on a formula and then that that's it they're they don't experiment or they don't commit to improving they don't adapt they don't change they yeah don't. and i would also say like you need a north star you know like you need to know what people are gonna get for me I go back to what I said earlier it was fun and informative when I I was struggling when I was making the first videos that weren't push-ups and and those two words came and it was like okay whenever I was out shooting I'm like okay like I just need to make it fun and informative and if and I, and I want to make sure I'm giving people information and and making them laugh and and those were like north stars whatever your north star is it needs to be boiled down into a couple of things that can guide your process mm-hmm. and then um just you know focus on your uh, on your strengths make sure you use them whatever they are mine was editing and so i made sure i put a lot of time into the editing because and that, that's a huge advantage i think for you over most people starting it's you, you're already leaps ahead of everyone because you have that editing skill and someone, it's very easy to go film. I can go film, but if you can't edit, you're kind of screwed, right? Yeah. So, though, mo- and- I guess, but you say, see, I mean, I would say like, and the thing that I thought would have been impossible and it's turned out okay is going and filming, okay, yeah, anyone can go film, but like a lot of people would come and their strength would be their on-camera presence, you know, just, they might be a natural and okay. Now learn how to edit. Like this is the thing, focus on your strengths and work your ass off to top up your weaknesses. And so be honest with yourself and, and what it, what are your strengths? Yeah. Editing is a good strength to have. And I, and I agree, like, like anyone can pick up a camera and film, but I could be the best editor in the world. And if I film myself and I'm, and I'm, you know, not, there's a balance to it. There's a ba- well, that's a skill. That's like if you're a natural at being an on camera persona to talk about whatever your niche is, that's a better strength. That you can it, that's harder to learn than editing. But it seems I'm not here to you know stroke the ego, boost the ego. But you do. You're very natural on the camera, which is. That was un- unexpected. I honestly thought yeah, there's because, no way I can do this because of that. Because, well, you come from the film industry, but you're behind the scenes. But you're oh, doing, yeah. maybe you kind of naturally picked that up from being on sets and picked it up from the, the these actors or whoever you're around and be, just being involved in the process. Do you think that had something to do with it? No, I, I, I maybe, maybe some of, like, it, I, I think more, I guess. Like, did it rub off on you maybe just presenting to uh to 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 people and rooms of people but it was all in small settings like i don't know i and to me that one i can't answer that's a shock to me that that i'm that i don't freeze up when i start to try and need to say stuff on camera that was absolutely shocking to me but there'd be a ton of people out there who are good at that and don't know the first thing about editing then devour videos on how to edit Mm. And improve. I, I'm good at editing picture. I suck at editing sound. Like I, I, I could, I could work on that all day long. You know, I, I'm not. I, I suck at coloring. I could be a way better colorist. So I still watch videos on how to improve that end of the the game. 
Yeah, I, I'm, I'm, we're experiencing that, that too, uh, especially on the sound side. It's, it's not, that's why a lot of the equipment we bought, it's kind of like, uh, I don't want to do it yourself or it's just, it's out of the box, ready to go. We didn't need to buy one of these complicated mixers. Yeah. I'd rather spend a bit more and have something, just click a button and let's go and, you know, with and, the mics as well. Yeah. And it's great. I mean, you did the right thing because you, I were talking about advice for new YouTubers, like one of the biggest pieces of advice would be don't forget about sound like the 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 number one thing production quality we production value like there's a term that we have how much money's on screen it was it's always this term in the film business production value and everyone thinks it's all picture and then where you really notice the difference between an amateur and a pro is how much attention they put on sound because Do you use one of those sound banks? Do you sign up for those? Sound I don't banks? yet. I, I want to. I only use uh, YouTube's um, sound library, uh, the okay. free YouTube sound library, but I want to sign up. I'm probably going to sign up. What, what, are, what is that you're referring like, to? I think you're talking about like Epidemic like Sound. Like Epidemic, Bender, and all those. All of these, yeah. yeah. Ah. I, I'm going to, and I just haven't gotten around to it yet. Yeah. But uh, I definitely want to because the YouTube library is getting a little long in the tooth yeah. on my channel. <laughs> and you're, say. Re you're the same songs are the oh, same. Oh, yeah, yeah, for sure. Which isn't terrible for some things because some things are series based on my channel. And it's like if, if it goes back to a, 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 a unknown, like every TV series has theme music. They yeah. play the same song every week. Like the new, your newscasting, it's, you're going to be yeah. using the same song. Yeah, that's fine. That's part of that series brand. Any, any show you watch on TV does that, yeah. but I could definitely use a better library. Yeah. How, how, in your sound editing process. So I saw you're using one, just one of the basic road mics. They're these, these, they're more bulky. They, they they're, that's what you're using. Oh, they're for. hideous. Yeah, they're hideous, right? Yeah, that's why yeah. we didn't buy them. We bought the, what do we have? Sarah. We have a ceremony. Ceremonic. Ceremonics. Yeah. Yeah. But any, either one of them, if you plug in a lav, which I just don't bother doing, yeah. it's far less hideous. But I generally, that's rare. I generally use the, the, yeah. the microphone on my iPhone. So, yeah, let's. It's rare that I use that mic. Let's talk about your technology. What are you using and why did you choose to use this technology? And I, I think that could be. In, good information for new YouTubers as well. So they don't need to, I can clip this and say, this is what one oh, of the Oh yeah, top for YouTube. sure, man. Yeah. Like what's in my camera bag here? The, yeah. the Brendan <laughs> edition. Yeah, there we go. What's in my camera bag? This is it. That's in my camera bag right here. So I have a state of the art <laughs> two camera system. I don't even have the third camera on here. And, but, but, oh, yeah, sound, sound, so, so. sounds, everything. What's in, oh, there it is. The best microphone that I could come up with right here is uh, is is in the palm of my hand. That's no, it. 90% of everything I've ever put out has been recorded audio and video with this. Now, I've toyed with the idea. I love cam. I mean, we... I rented cameras. Yeah. I love camera technology. That We'd rent camera packages out on average for 25 grand a week was a, ca a typical camera package rental. I love it. Um, but at the same time for YouTube, I can't, I, I want to get it, but it's more just a toy for me. It's not, it's certainly not necessary. And it would add a lot of work on the back end when you're dealing with it. It would this. add a lot of work on the front end and the back yeah. end, man. Like you got it at that point. Yeah. Both, yeah. both ends, it would add a lot of work. And I, you're not using like any, not selfie sticks, but tight, what are they? It's like the, you were talking about it, the. Uh, like uh, stabilizers, like Osmo Action. Oh, I, I have uh, like a, a, a non-stabilized little mini tripod, one of those Manfrotto's, 90% ah, of Manfrotto. the videos. Manfrotto, yeah. Because the, the phones have it all built in, right? What's happening in phone technology is so mind blowing when it comes to cameras. It's gimbal like stability. So the only I have a DJI OM4. Sure, I'll help move move the mic down. I always adjust if we go there. There you go. Okay, good. Yeah, just because if we clip it, then it won't be like this. Okay, sorry, I can't. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And the problem with these couches is you start to slide. Oh yeah, this is what's happening. Yeah. I'm losing myself. <laughs> it's all right. Yeah. <laughs> So, so um, I, I have a, so we're talking about the phone technology. Yeah. I have a DJI OM4. Yeah. Um, which is one of those little gimbals. The only time I ever use it is when I go live stream because 
it's a weird thing that the, that the YouTube app disables the iPhone's in-app stabilization oh. if you are going live. And so I found that out the hard way the first time I ever went live. I'm like, why is it so shaky? And then I, I just put one and one together. They must have they must have little teams of lawyers fighting over that one. But yeah. so I got the gimbal only for that. If I, otherwise the iPhone has stabilization built in now computationally that's gimbal like. Now they have the new iPhone that has this cinematic mode that allows depth of field to be like expensive glass, you know, full size sensor chip like, and that's in its infancy, but it's all happening so fast on the, on the phone technology that, that, um, I don't know. I still might get a, 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 a high end, well, a high end for a YouTuber camera one day mm. as much for myself as for, for the necessity of it. So if anyone out there's watching and saying, how could I ever start a channel? I only have my phone. It's like, well, A, the phone's good enough right now, and B, they're just getting better every year. And it's not about that. It's never been about that. It's about your 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 story you're trying to tell, the community you're trying to build. And um, so you're using the microphone off the phone most of the time, but when do you decide to use your Rode mic? If I have, there's only two reasons, and I only got that a few months ago. There's only two reasons if I have two people. Uh, it's awesome because there's two mics, so I can do... Uh, uh, do, do you have two Rode mics going to one yeah, adapter? Yeah, that's, that's the Rode go-to. Oh, okay. They added a yeah, second we, one. The Ceremonic always had that. The problem with the Ceremonics, they're quite... The adapters are quite bulky. They're like, oh, okay. Yeah, they're like this big, but ah. I was going to buy that uh, the Rode, but then we saw the Lavaliers look just so bulky and yeah. ugly. Well, they have a Lav that you can... K, you can buy it separately. That's a true lav. Okay. These ones that, yeah, these things. And I just wear it. I clip it on. I don't give a crap. So only if you're, I think I saw, maybe you were talking to Nando or Sean, and then that's when you're micing yeah, people. If I have two people, then I'm talking to someone. It's it's awesome. Big improvement. Or if I want to get a shot creatively where the camera's farther away from me, which that adds the ability to be a bit more creative in that regard, because if the phone is way over there, then it can't record my audio, but I can do these nice wide shots. Um, so those are the only two times I use it. Otherwise, I just record 90% of this video on my channel is... Off, is just right is, off the is phone. It's just me off the phone picture and video. And then in, on the editing editing side of the audio, you're, are you putting a lot of time on that to kind of clean that up? Not a lot of time. What I did was search a bunch of YouTube videos and I found... A couple of amazing things and this was early on and I can't even remember what they were but they were settings for how to I was googling how to how to do like poor man's audio mix how to make your voice sound which for me is impossible but how to make your voice sound better audio recording sound better so so I found these three settings an EQ a compressor and a limiter and I dialed it in for what I liked for my, and I've saved that as a preset. Yeah. And for the last year and a half, it goes on every clip of I've ever used. And then all I do is mix the levels. So for, for the audience out there, that that's probably it's it's that's kind of a, a nug a golden nugget there. Figure out these presets. Figure out what or figure out these. Uh, uh, different variables that you're manipulating and find your preset and just stick to that. Exactly. And then that saves your time on the audio. I cut yeah. and paste every time I cut the picture and before I touch the audio, I just cut the story because I don't want to waste time on audio that's going to get cut anyway. Cut the picture and then I, once I have my picture locked and cut, then I'll, I'll cut and paste. I'll apply that preset that yeah. I did a year and a half ago when I first got serious and and haven't really improved on it yet, but I like it. I apply it to every single clip, and then from there, it's just yeah, just the levels based on uh, on levels. That's that. So it's it's the audio is quite a simple process there, and then and then mixing in some sound effects and some music on top of that. At your level, uh, and this is a good segue in, into to your craft. Um, um, again, you started off all by yourself. Um, and then I'm chatting on Instagram. So you have someone doing your social. 
how has your team grown over the past year and a half? Who is the retired working for you team? Yeah, yeah, that's a, a good question. Um, so for the first year, it was just me, 100%. And then, uh, and this is kind of something that we're just about to kind of start letting the cat out of the bag on. But I brought on a Thai intern named Fa. Uh, she was my Thai teacher, and she was looking to get out of that and get into digital marketing. So I gave her a three-month internship while she was studying, and I thought at the end of the three months, she'll have a bit of a resume and she can go get a, a job. But then she started adding a lot of value. And so, and she's having fun. We're having fun working together. And so she's staying on and she manages a lot of the social media and, uh, and everything's a work in progress. And then my nephew uh, called me up uh, is it Adam? Adam. Okay, I'm chatting with him. Yeah. Yeah. So he called me up when I was like getting close to a hundred thousand subscribers. He's like, "Yo, Uncle Chris, you realize like what you have there? Like you could you could build businesses around this 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 YouTube channel." And he just graduated university last year, business degree. I'm like, well, like I'm retired, man. Like I I I I built a business. I'm not. Uh, I said, do you could build businesses or do you want to? And he's like, are you serious? I'm like, yeah, if you why don't. So he moved to Thailand, man. Like he's, he's over here. Uh, he's kind of nomadic as well, but he's here a lot of the time. And, uh, and so he's working on some secret projects that, uh, I can't talk about yet for you or his own stuff. No, no, for me, like, okay. so there's going to be a, like a universe around retired working for you that my nephew, it's a family. We just need a couple more beers in Oka. That's right. It's <laughs> a, joking. it's a family business. Um, yeah. and he's going to be, you know, flexing his newfound young, ambitious muscles with his business degree and and we're gonna launch some things and mm. see what happens and maybe it flops maybe it is wildly successful yeah, and then but you use the channel as the marketing platform to drive yeah yeah drive. that's it yeah. and so that's that's the team is, is he in phuket or is he, he's here right now yeah here, we're just hanging and, out and is he uh in terms of nomadic like is he doing the same thing as you he's you know you get people going Phuket, Copenhagen, Koh Samui. Oh, yeah. He's all over the place. Over, yeah. yeah, yeah. And then once the world opens up, he'll be in and out of Thailand as yeah. well. But uh, so, yeah, that's, the team. that's me, the team. Me and my nephew and Foskey. So shout yeah. out to Adam and Foskey. There you go. Awesome. That's it, man. Like I've done the big, you know, I, and I thought bigger was better in the corporate world. And, you know, we'll build as big a company as we can. It was fun for a while. And then it got there and it sucked. And so now I want just a nice little small family type of vibe. And uh, so yeah. far, that's exactly what we're going to try and do. Keep the stress low. Keep the process simple. Yeah. And no, yeah. Make no it need. fun. Yeah. It's, yeah, yeah. Yeah. And for for this this channel, is there anything big that you're you're thinking about doing in the channel itself? Like maybe a web series, something outside of the vlogging side. Maybe it's a... Uh, kind of similar, like a four-day travel web series or a anything that the viewers could look forward to? Um, Yeah, we don't really think <laughs> that, Not that far. far I hate hey. to disappoint your <laughs> <Sorry>. viewers, but <laughs> uh, but uh, we don't really think that far ahead as it pertains to that sort of stuff. Again, there is a secret project being worked yeah. on that's that's outside the channel that that is something to I think to be very excited about and that's going to come in a few months um yeah I'm just excited to kind of you know start integrating in some of this nomadic lifestyle into the channel mm -hmm. I think that in this new world uh it's 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 intriguing to a lot of people and I think a lot of people could benefit by seeing someone doing it and maybe that inspires them to uh, to take that leap, and so that might come in the form of it's going to come in the form of more. I was predominantly Bangkok for the last two years. That's now going to come in the form of Phuket, Samui, Bangkok, Chiang Mai. Like we're going to be all over Thailand to close out the rest of this year, and then it also might come in the form of I'd love to share my love of Korea with with my followers as well, and anyone out there who loves Korea. 
there's a lot of stuff I'd like to sh- I'd like to give that a crack and see. And, and that could work because I think you you kept it going quite well when when you're in Canada. Um, and that was probably a concern, like, are, do you lose fo- subscribers? Are people going to stop watching? But I think you, you kept it together. Now, you pre-planned that content before going home, meaning, like, I saw that I watched the video. I think it's one of your newest ones where you filmed the guy's coffee shop and you gave him some money to expand. Oh, yeah. And then you came back. So it's immediate, like, uh, you, you see this instant gratification and, and, and he's put the money to use how much pre-planning went into your content before leaving just to kind of keep yourself safe? Yeah. So, so that one wasn't pre-planned that I had shot that to try and the goal to shooting that one before leaving was to release it while I was in Canada Mm. out of this, you know, I wanted to keep Thailand content going. And so I was going to release like a Thailand video every week. Then I got back to Canada and I just kind of, got more into vacation mode to be honest and i and i just didn't do it and so i got back here and i'm like well i have this video that i shot three months ago of say and he said he was going to build this thing did he build it let's go see oh my god he built it this is awesome say i'm gonna bookend the video and now it's gonna be that much better of a video and then instead of using it you save it for the right time and yeah hmm. and then on and then there was another one the most pre-planning was the second last video I did where I interviewed myself from two um, months and ago. And the predictions. Yeah, and yeah, the yeah, predictions. Yeah. And so I went down to Soy Cowboy a couple of days before leaving. And uh, that one took a lot of uh, pre-planning to, to kind of have that. Connect the interview so it doesn't get yeah. too lost. Yeah. yeah, to have a back and forth dialogue of, of, of that at different times. So that one took, and other than that, there wasn't much planning. But YouTube's a funny game, man. Like, part of me wishes it was like, I come from the world of network TV. You go for like 10 months, and then your season's done. But YouTube, you cannot. Everyone goes home. Everyone chills. Everyone relaxes. And then you get your energy, and then you come back. YouTube's like that hamster wheel, man. You, you, the, you can never stop. Yeah, and I wonder if that'll be that way forever. That's what a lot of the the big, big, big YouTubers, 6 million followers or subscribers plus, they say it's all about consistency. Like it's part of the algorithm, meaning if you post every Tuesday, you have to post every Tuesday because the algorithm is saying, well, all these people are watching Tuesday. There must be something for that. And if you miss a step like a month, it's hard to come back. Yeah, which that that part of it is a little weird, and, and and I hope over the longer term, there's been some people been able to break out of that mold, some big YouTubers. Uh, I hope over the long term, like part of me thinks like, don't people aren't people aren't you sick of me? Like aren't aren't people gonna like? Do they really want it? Fifty two weeks of the year? Don't wouldn't it be better if 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 we all took a break? Me from doing it, you from me, and then suddenly a a month and a half later, it's like, oh, the excitement level. We're all back doing it again. Yeah, but I think the way for me personally, like if I I don't watch, so again, I watch your stuff at lunch, but I could take a month off. Now, the beauty is your shows are only 10 minutes, so I can take the whole month off and go on on other YouTubers and then come back to you and queue up four in a row. Now I've watched 40 minutes. Yeah. So that's... Yeah, that's true. It works. This, this is what works for me. Because again, other YouTubers, you, you get bored after a while and then you want variety. But then you come back and you're like, okay, I've missed five episodes. Let yeah. me catch up. Yeah, that's true. Yeah. That's true. And and and, and yeah, I mean, yeah, I ended up going to the biggest gap of uh, ever since I started the channel. My last two and a half weeks, I think, in, in Canada, I didn't post a video, which was by far the longest that I'd ever gone without posting a video and uh yeah it's a little weird man it's a little nerve-wracking it's like what's gonna happen do you feel the pressure like to produce to push out knowing that you you can lose uh rank or you know on certain keywords that you're obviously you're ranking for yes and no yes and no like no because if if i want like I, i have the luxury of being able to uh go back to being retired if i want You know, like I think uh, if I had to do YouTube with the pressure of it being my sole and necessary source of income, the answer would be a resounding yes. But for me personally, 
at any point in time, it's like, if it doesn't work out, okay, I can go back to being retired. The world will open up. I can start traveling. I don't want that. The reason why it still is a yes is because I love the game, man. I love, I love the YouTube game. And more than that, I love this community that's being built around it. And, and that, and then I, now I start to feel some responsibility to my nephew, to the Thai staff. Uh, yeah. And so, yeah, a bit of pressure there. But at the same time, not nowhere near like someone who needs it to pay the rent. And maybe, and that that could be another reason for the success of the channel. It allows you to be creative because someone that solely relies on their YouTube to to you know put food on the table, they can't be as creative. They need to create content that feeds the what the audience wants. Meaning your your challenges, spend your five dollars in a day, condos. They might have to do that content over and over. Yeah, they would. They would. They and would, instead and of being able to try something new, because they know that recipe works. But yeah. for you, if you don't care, it's you can be creative. Yeah, and I do. And I think you're right. I do think that allow was part of why, like, uh, you know, uh, uh, an old guy with with uh, not a ton to offers was able to succeed early on was because the I don't give a crap mentality, I think, came through to people. And they liked that. They're like, that guy doesn't yeah. give a crap. Well, it's like the analogy, uh, never sit down at a poker table with money you can't lose. Mm -hmm. Right? And when, yeah. you, when, when, you, when you're relying on something too much, you always lose. Yeah. Because the, the wrong emotions come into play. Um, I, I had uh, just a couple more questions. And, um, well, we've had a few beers, but we're, <laughs> we're feeling lively now. When, at, at which point, at which point when you reach a, a certain level of success, when can you say like, okay, this channel is successful? Is it the 30 subs, the 50 subs when you pass 100? And this is kind of a two-part question. With that success is going to bring weirdos. Random DMs, oh, comments, yeah. pe people, who knows, showing up at the places, at the parks where you are. Like, when did that happen? And I'm sure it has. Yeah. Yeah, as far as the like two part question, I'd say, when does it feel like you've achieved success? It, like every milestone, it does, but then it never does because I remember a hundred. It was like, well, a hundred subscribers. Well, that's a real six because then you get the plaque. Did you get the plaque yet? Or uh, no, no, that was a hundred thousand. That's what. I, but they never I, sent it to you. No, no, not yet. YouTube. Yeah, what YouTube. Are you, what are you and, doing? And by the way, like, the, there's been a lot of back and forth on that. Thank God we haven't been allowed to throw parties over here because when I get the plaque, I'm going <laughs> to throw a big-ass party. I'm going to throw that plaque in the ocean. Yeah. <laughs> Screw you guys. And, no, but but I'm at 100, yeah. literally 100 subscribers. Okay. Not 100,000. Like, when I got 100, that was... I would say almost as exciting as a hundred thousand. It was just, it was unbelievable. And then a thousand was crazy. That was, might've been the biggest one where it's like, whoa, a thousand. Cause now it's more than my friends, right? A okay. hundred. It's like, eh, it might got, be all my friends. Most of it was. <laughs> yeah. Most of it was. And a thousand. It's, there's no way that can be my friends, man. I don't I don't know. I don't even know that many people. This is crazy. And so it, it's like every milestone's crazy, but then it's and then it then it all kind of instantly fades to like, okay, what's next? That's the game. So I, I don't know that that ever ends. I don't know that you could have 10 million and you're not still like, well, that's crazy. I got 10 million. Subs but like, okay, what's next? Yeah, there's always just, I guess, in the world of, uh, of you know, it's a capitalistic world, making more money wins the end. There's and no it's end. also a big sandbox. Yeah. It's like, that's the beauty of the YouTube game. It's just like, it's the whole world's there. Mm -hmm. So, but that part of it, again, that, that doesn't, really drive me it's a fun part of the game but i would re way rather cap myself out at say a half a million is that your do you have a goal no no goal just no goal at all happens. this is the first time i've even talked about this with anyone but i it, just thinking out loud i'd rather cap out at, at five hundred thousand, but have this engaged cool community than have like 10 million that are just kind of fly by nighters or whatever coming and going and like mm. I, like again i don't like i want it to be a more engaged you know universe based around the love a common love of thailand do you read the comments oh yeah 
All well, you probably, almost all of them. How many would you get on average? Would you say per video, like a thousand, two thousand? No comments. No, a few hundred. Few hundred, and you'll you'll personally will read them all. Almost, almost. How unless time, I'm unless I'm on vacation or how something. How time consuming is that? Yeah, uh, an hour a day. I respond to a Just bunch. Try to chip away at it. Yeah, I, I yeah I respond to a bunch and and I flip and flop. I sometimes it's like my nephew will tell me, oh, does, you don't even read the comments sometimes, and like forget about it. And I'm like, well, but again, the goal is more of a community. So I love, I like recognizing the same names in there. Mm. I know so many names of my followers, and to see them pop up time and again, it it gives you energy. And then you see them on the live, so you can. Oh yeah, yeah, exactly. It's it's amazing. Yeah. It gives you energy, and then the and then you get the 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 negative ones. Which yeah. How, how do you do? You respond to them or you ignore them? I have responded. I remove some. I went through phases, and I'll probably continue to go through phases. It's a weird thing about humans, man. It's like we we can get ninety eight percent positive stuff, but the two percent is the loudest. Mm. And it's the shit that sticks with us that you're thinking about at night. It's like, we're weird, man. Like, and, and I'm no different. And so early on, it definitely bothered me. And then now it really doesn't. I mean, for the last, I don't know, six months, I've been in a headspace where I find it almost comical. Um, and sometimes it is beyond comical. It's like, you know, I had someone post the other day. I posted about how great of a time I'm having in the Phuket sandbox and why now is a great time to come to Thailand. Yep. To which there's a lot of people say, blah, blah, blah. But one of them was, it's raining there, man. It's why would you go? I'm like, it's raining? And so that's... that's Do your, you respond to that That's comment? your big anger. No, no. It no. Should, but it did stick with me to the point where I'm sitting here talking to you he's about got, he's it. He's got real estate in your head, that guy. Exactly. <laughs> but it's comical. It's like, man. And then I start to think to myself, how? How? Like, how could you enjoy any day when the threat of rain would ruin it all? Like, holy shit, yeah, but those, shit, pe- those people, they're just trolling. They want you to reply. That's well, their that's fire. It. That's that, their fuel. And that's it. And that's what you got to realize. You're right. Bang on. And so if you do, it's a no-win situation. You're throwing gasoline on the fire that they've started, and that's yeah, what they it's, want. It's I've, I, oh, I, I think I could tell this story. Yeah, yeah. yeah? Oh, I, this one's fucked up. <laughs> <laughs> so like we're we're growing quick. You want attention, yeah. We're we're growing really quick now. Like uh, like I think for us I feel we are. Like we have we've been we've only been online for what? 2 3 months? 3 months. So yeah. and for a podcast it's harder to grow. Sure. But we have over f- almost I think almost 500 th- 500 subscribers on YouTube. Nice. Um but then on Instagram we're getting like 100 200 a week. And then the other day I get this, uh, so we do the unfollow follow on Instagram, but like really focused on the right people. It's not just like whatever. It's people that we're trying to focus on Thailand first. So whatever. Yeah. Followed unfollow. And then I guess I followed someone that said, uh, what did it say? 14 year old rapper. I don't know. It's like, oh, it just he looked Thai, whatever. He's, he's there. I'm not really paying attention. Yeah. Then I get a, a DM and it's his dad. Apparently he goes, you're a pedophile. You're following my son. I'm oh, like, God. I go, I, 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 I felt bad because maybe it's the father that doesn't understand it. I said, there's a social media thing. Follow, unfollow. I don't even know I'm following. Uh, you want to give me a call? I'll talk to you. I'm not a pedophile. So we, he, he calls. And I do the oh, face. Oh, he calls. He calls. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And I don't see the face. And it's my face. I'm like, where the hell is this guy? And some dude just whips out his cock. No yes. way. I go, what the fuck? I just hung up and deleted and blocked them right away. That's so, mental. Story out there. Don't answer those calls. Well, that's yeah. it. Like, it was so strange. Uh, you know, they, they <laughs> like that's that says it all, right? Yeah, like these are people in dark basements. Yes. And it's like, like out of all this shit that used to bother me about the negative comments that really doesn't anymore... Uh, one of the breakthrough moments, I was walking from my house down Soy 23 to the BTS, and I was like ornery after a couple of negative comments that morning. And I wanted to see someone like just, and I'm no tough guy, but I wanted to see someone <laughs> come and say it to my face. Okay. And then I realized, you know how many times that's happened? Zero. 
zero times has someone said it to their face because that's not what they do. They and then on to the next and then on to the next and yeah that me and all my buddies in Bangkok man and that's Thailand in a nutshell to all of you who might not know Thailand or are thinking of living here. There's two camps expats man. The ones that sit around and natter about how everything here sucks. Yeah. The government's stupid and yeah. Thai people are dumb and this is stupid and why do they do that? And then there's me and my buddies in Bangkok going like, there's like 200 other countries you could live in. Why don't you go pick one you like? Yeah, I know. But, but I, that's, that's not what they that's, want. That's expat mentality. Yeah, that's, that's not Asia. what they want. It's yeah, not it's, all expat. Like, <laughs> no, no, not all. I mean, in general. It, there's there, two camps, there, there man. There is two camps, yeah. There's two camps, I, and I, they're firmly divided. There's the ones that hate everything about the country they've chosen to live in, and that's all they want to talk about when they go out drinking. And then there's me and my buddies that, Lo- they focus on all the shit we love about yeah, it having a and good want time. to talk about that when we go out drinking. Yeah, it's, I, I get a lot, oh, the ties can't drive and this and that. It's like, for, for me, it's a bit different. I went through the ringer. I lived yeah. in China six years. So when I came here, I'm like, oh my God, this is, because pe- that's <laughs> a hard place to live. Oh yeah, I bet. So, and I couldn't live there. You no, know, it was very difficult. So when I came here, people are like, yeah, they drive this way. I go, in China, if they miss an exit on the highway, they will stop. And back up on a highway, people going 120 kilometers sure. an hour. Oh, I missed it. Better back. <laughs> and like easily a transport truck could take them out. And <laughs> so I love it here. I've never had, I've never complained about it once here. Yeah. I, I love every, everything that the way, especially the ways thing, the way it works here and how you can, you have that freedom. And I don't want to say you can get away with anything in, in that sense, but like you really, it's very, my, my Ben and I. Oh, exactly. Yeah. yeah it's, it's, it's awesome, man. Yeah, we're on the same page there, and and so all these negative comments, like at the, for the last six months, I've I haven't wavered, and and like I have gone in waves, and I'm like I said, I think there will be other waves come back when they bother me again, but I'm going on six months where I find it comical. Yeah, I've tried. We've had a few negative ones, but I'm 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 pretty ruthless. Like I'll just chirp them right back. Oh yeah. I'll be like easy bud. Like, yeah. Yeah. I'll sit back in your, your mom's basement. And <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Part of me wants to, but then like you said, that's all they want, man. Yeah, like, yeah. it's like, why give them the benefit? And, and then you got to think to yourself, it's like, man, it's not fair. And someone called me out on it on a live stream. That was my breakthrough moment. And that was probably six months ago that I was on a live stream and some Yahoo was spouting a bunch of crap. And I started hammering in on that. And then other people started commenting, why are you answering his questions? And you're ignoring all of us yeah. who are positive and supportive. And I'm like, wow. Yeah. Like, it's so not fair to the 98% who are supportive and add to the conversation and want, and they don't get my time or my response. Like, what a dickhead I am. And that's, and you've, you've fueled his fire. That's exactly that's what all I'm he at. wants. So I've, I've just lost. Like, what a, what a, that was a bad move. That's not fair to the people who are here to, to, to actually support. How, when, when you're walking the streets in Bangkok or you're filming, do you ever get random fans on the positive side that come up to you? And oh, they every, notice you? yeah, every, every day. Especially like in your area where you were living in Bangkok. Do you get that in random places? I like, got it in Toronto, which really? shocked that crap. Like a me. random will notice you. Now, oh, are you yeah. walking or you're vlogging and they walking. notice Walking. Walking. Yeah, but I mean, I, got, I wear this shirt every so day. But, but yeah, it shocked me in Toronto. One day I went to get bagel and coffee for breakfast at 7.30 in the morning walking up Queen Street, and within 10 minutes, three different people came up. I'm like, this is Toronto. This is bizarre. Bangkok, it's it, it's it's hilarious. And it's surreal. But that's that's daily. That's if I go, if I'm out the, if I go more than ten minutes out of the house than Bangkok, and I think part of it is in, in the current situation, there's less foreigners when the whole world's open, and there's way more. You'll kind of blend into yeah. the crowd now. Yeah, Do, yeah. Does it bother you? Ooh, I mean, because it's t- it's your time. Yeah. Like, imagine twenty people come up to you walking on the street. That's going to take maybe an hour out of your day. Are, are you okay yeah, with that? Or, or you, yeah, or, do you have a way to kind of get could, away? That could be one thing that leads me to quit one day, potentially. But at the same time, so far it's been kind of 
nice. Everyone's been, most people are super cool and they're just like, oh, blah, blah, blah. And, you know, quick. hello, they want to say hello. Yeah. And then the, maybe a selfie or a picture or something like this, which is just funny, man. My wife and daughter laugh. I'm laughing. They're like, they're, and I'm like, it's, it's ridiculous. Really. And it's so fast. It's, it's not like. It's just, you know, it's so. just, it's, it's surreal. It's mm -hmm. surreal. And on one hand, it's kind of enjoyable, right? Because it's like, I don't know, it feeds that part of the human psyche. The ego, yeah. Sure. And, and then on the other hand, like, it's like, well, <clears> you don't want too much of that. Like too much of that would be bad. Yeah. Um, so I, I have no idea, man. All I know is the people that have approached me so far have been super cool. Have you ever had any like uh, negative no nope. confrontations? Never. Anything like that was a, or st like st strange, like Never. maybe someone trying to sell you something or get something out of you or. No, on dig digitally, digitally, digitally. Yeah. Well, like that, I get a lot of people reaching that's, out. But that's copy paste stuff half the time. Yeah. Right? Yes. Yeah. And, and there's a lot of people that I guess in the YouTube game, they think you're very accessible and it's like i like i just I've, i i put a lot into it i want some free time with hey lee you know i can't answer facebook messages instant messages yeah. that come in 50 a day right yeah it's too much you know so that that part but but no no the no no negatives like just some weird ones the the funny thing is and, and this happens semi-regularly like they think that we know each other because they've connected with you so much yeah, through the video. Yeah, it's weird. Like yeah. I, I, one guy in the street in Toronto. I'm like, I'm like, uh, he's like, oh, hello. I'm like, and I, and I, and I purposely knew that he was one of the ones that thought we knew each other, and I, and I, and I wanted to make him kind of squirm a little bit. I'm like, hi, do I, do I know you? Well, you're the, you're the retired working for you. I'm like, well, yeah, like. Like I was on your screen, but I, we were, I wasn't actually there. And, and then he snapped into it. He's like, oh yeah, you don't know me, man. And I'm like, yeah, no, like, but nice to meet you. And then it's, and it's also uncomfortable because I want to introduce myself. Hey, I'm Chris. Oh, I know. And you got Haley and your nephew's Adam and everyone oh. knows everything. And I'm like, oh wow, that's bizarre, man. Yeah. Because, well, cause you're in the public eye now. Yeah. Right? So that's, that's, and, and is there any part of you that, uh, because you've only been doing it a year and a half. Is there any part of you that feels like, is this just a 15 minutes of fame? Or is this something that could go for 5, 10 years? Or is it just, ah, whatever? I hope it can go for 5 or 10 years because it's based around my true passion, which is Thailand, and it gets me digging deeper into Thailand. And so, you know, uh, I hope it can last Um you know, it, it, based around that, there's a whole lot more of this country I can discover and mm -hmm. share. And so we'll see. Time will tell. There's certainly part of me that thinks, yeah, to, to a certain point, everyone's going to just click and that'll be that. That'll be done. Like, that was interesting. You feel like they could, there's a part of you that feels like everyone will just stop watching one day. Oh, for sure, man. Like, part of you feels like, like, how, like, how did this happen? Like, of course they're going to, aren't, this is weird. Well, I think uh, uh, if you diversify your content, like you saying, you've kind of left Bangkok, you'll be traveling, and now the sky's the limit. You ever, you can be so creative because a lot of the places you'll go to, like Phuket, Pig Beach, you don't even know about these places. So yeah. there's so much opportunity. I uh, just had a, a couple more questions because we're already at two and a half hours. That's how fast it goes. Whoa. Uh, well, beer, beer makes things easy. <laughs> um uh, for any YouTubers out there that are, are looking to start a channel and make it a lifestyle and, and walk away from the nine to five, at what point is YouTube a, a viable uh, source of income? If people want to go down that path, could they survive on YouTube? And um, at which point does it become viable? You got to pass a hundred thousand to even have a chance to survive off this and leave your nine to five. Yeah. I think that the, future is going to open up i guess it's like i like i've heard other people talk about this a middle class on of youtube i think the first era phase one of youtube was the that it was like hand pick a few celebrity youtubers they make all the money and everyone else you can't make a living off of it we're entering a new era where i think if you could get shirt, sure, I would say, let's say a hundred to five, a uh, hundred to five hundred thousand subscribers. 
if if these are engaged subscribers and you're building a community around a common passion that you and your subscribers share, I completely think that there's an opportunity to make a decent living at it mm-hmm. based on offering things to this this group of people that are valuable to them mm-hmm. that they like that that they that they are uh that that just provides them value and, f- and finding other ways to make revenue outside obviously the monetization of youtube but maybe of your, your patreons buy me a coffee merch a lot of ways to like uh capitalize on your audience as well a hundred percent like like definitely you got to think outside of youtube i give a hundred percent of my youtube revenue to my pay it forwards yes so that's zero for supporting what's uh starting for me which is you know at my nephew adam and fa which are need you know everyone you know there's going to be a a business with revenue based around that the YouTube revenue zero because I give a hundred percent of it to paying it forward. So yeah. And then it's, I think right now phase two is all these platforms as well that allow you to crack open a few different revenue streams, Patreon, you named it, you know, some Teespring merch or whatever. Buy me a coffee. Buy me a coffee. But phase three is going to be digital storefronts, maybe even physical storefronts where you can interact with your uh your your community like discord and going down the no like i like i mean like we're doing a membership program but we don't use patreon Mm. we just do it ourselves your website so you're not paying you're saving the do it all ourselves we do merch but we we do it ourselves and we involve a thai t-shirt company rather than go on the teespring route we don't want it to be cookie cutter because our niche is people who love Thailand. So if we're going to do something, like why don't we hand make shirts in Thailand rather than go the easy route Buy it in China. And, and, and have it click on Teespring and it never even touches Thailand. Like these things are being made with love by Thai people yeah. and Thai artists painting the graphics that are going on the shirts. And I think that that's the opportunity to create your a middle class of this creator economy that will allow people to make a living off of a much smaller base of subscribers and viewership. And yeah, and I, I, I totally uh, agree with that and what you're doing in that sense, especially like when I was, I was checking your, your, your information, I've read your whole backstory into awkward, but that's probably another 20 minutes. We'll wrap it up soon. I thought that was, cause it's on the website. I thought that was a very interesting story from yeah. your friend and how this came together. But, um, one of my last questions is do sponsorships approach you? Meaning like you, you have your vlog and you come out and you do a shout out to a hotel company or something like this. Have they approached you? Would you consider like going down the advertising route within your content or do you want to avoid that completely? had a conversation about that with Adam this morning because we've had we have like three potential sponsorship deals that have just been offered to us I won't I, I don't think you're allowed to talk about what they no, are that's fine but um we landed on screw that one like we will never do that that to me is also phase one like it's that that can't be the future. That's the 1950s, man. This program brought to you by uh, this dishwasher detergent. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, that's the 1950s. Can we move into the future a little bit? Mm. I think there's going to be sponsorship opportunities for YouTube channels that are very futuristic, that aren't involved what they call a 60-second integration. But that said, if there's an opportunity to provide value for our viewers, we might consider it. But uh, the, the conversation I had this morning, one of them was like, no, like that can just go away. One of them we might do because we have something really funny. We think it's funny that we want to do based around it. And they might, they might not like what we're going to do to promote their brand so much. But, uh, but you can connect. You, we you, don't you care. Need to, the brand, the sponsorship needs to connect with the content. It need, It can't be just. You well, know. I think it should be completely integrated and yeah. woven into the the content. It shouldn't be like and and now this is brought to you by so and so. Exactly. 
And um, it needs to be built in like almost seamlessly without it looking like an ad either. And it needs to provide value yeah. for your community, real value for your community, things that they might be able to They'd get be interested benefit instead from. of just some random product. Yeah, know. yeah, agreed. Okay, uh, and my, my, my last question, because what time, we got to be at three hours now. Anyways, we're getting there. My last question is, what do your parents, friends, family, wife, daughter, what do they think about all this and what you're doing? <laughs> yeah, I mean, it, it, like they, they, they all think it's it's fun. They think it's funny. I think my daughter, she's gone through the as I did this. Sh I think initially she was a little embarrassed by it, and then now she's old enough and mature enough and and cool she's she's i think she likes it she thinks it's pretty fun and she actually helps me film stuff she's into film and stuff so she'll man the camera sometimes mm. and those have been the most special videos for me my wife thinks it's hilarious if we're out in terminal 21 and someone stops and asks for a selfie she just cracks up and thinks it's so funny and uh yeah, yeah. The, everyone thinks it's just everyone thinks and your it's parents cool. too because you went. Oh, back they home love it, and they, you got them involved. Hey, I've, they, I've, they were naturals on the camera. They were awesome. Yeah, they were I so that good. Was really, I feel sorry probably for their friends who they probably you know how how the the us older folks and them older even older folks yeah. would be. Well, I'd, let me tell you what my son's <laughs> doing then, and uh, so I feel sorry for their friends probably. But yeah, they love it. They think it's great. Yeah, they got right involved. They got yeah, involved. I thought, I thought it was very creative. They were the good. Way did they that. were good. Yeah, I thought yeah. it was. It was I got my dad to crack a happy endings joke. Yeah, uh, yeah. That, that was awesome. And he pulled it off with like flying colors. Yeah, I thought it was uh, It was well put together. And w when you're filming that, um, do you need to do many takes or is it pretty quick? Like you guys are pretty spot on. Like you're my, not da doing my dad's was three takes. Yeah. And what about yourself on your content? You're quick, or you're you're doing a couple takes to get. It through depends it? on the on the video. Sometimes uh, it's it's uh, oftentimes it's just the one take, and then editing will clean up stuff. And then sometimes there's multiple takes if it's something that really needs to be so timed out for the talk, edit. Talk longer, cut it all up. And yeah. Okay. Awesome. Well, that wraps up this episode. We've had a few beers, and uh, it's almost sunset time for me. Um, this is, it's not like what I always say that I'm not going to say that again. Well, I will like that show. Do you ever watch hot, hot ones? What they do? They yeah, the wings, the, they, yeah, the they wings, go, pick a camera, this camera. Well, this is cold ones. <laughs> yeah, there we go. Cold <laughs> ones. We might be on to something there. Can, uh, sample different beers and you go through a Ooh, whole case. There you My go. God. So this is your camera for our audience that might not know who you are. Um, whatever you want to plug, go ahead. Uh, I'd plug you guys getting getting back to Thailand, man. Uh, if you follow my channel, you know that this uh, country is, is uh, currently in a in a state that that needs you. It needs you to to just come back and enjoy it. And you don't know how much that would help this country. So my plug is for you guys to book a ticket and come on back here. And, and maybe a Leo sponsorship. Oh, well, Leo, Leo should definitely be paying me. And anyone from Leo out there, please give me a ring and uh, let's get this official here because I've been plugging you for a year and a half. Yeah, let's see. I even bought them Leos today. No one wanted them. That's right. There we man. go. You're, make, you're making money here, Leo. Okay. <laughs> that wraps up this episode. I always forget to say this. Subscribe. Don't smash. Just kind of. Go up to the like button to lightly tap it. I like to say tickle it. Oh, Just tickle, it. tickle yeah, the just, like button just, for this fella yeah, here. Yeah. Just tickle Give it a little, little tickle. Like button. Um, but no, really smash the subscribe. I'm serious. Do it. Okay, <laughs> we're out. Thank you. <laughs>